Um, so one of the areas that has uh, seen substantial work in the last 10 or 15 years is empirical analysis of macro models where you're using a large number of predictors. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different ways to think about this issue. Um, I, certainly when I was getting or preparing for these talks, uh, forcing yourself to go through all of this literature, I guess, gets you to make some connections that you certainly hadn't been consciously made, maybe subliminally, I don't know. But it, it seems as though one important theme running through many of the issues that we've talked about with GMM and DSGEs and, and hack estimation is limitations in the data that we actually work with. The questions that we want to answer are ones that are perhaps a little bit ambitious uh, compared to what the data are able to support. There, there seems there's basically two answers to that. One is given the data and the questions, try to come up with better software, that is better econometric algorithms, better distributions that can help you answer it. And the other approach is to see if you can get more data. So in the more data category, uh, in SVARs, that was what I was referring to the other day as thinking about natural experiments or bringing in something from the outside to help with identification. And this clearly falls in the more data or more information category. <clears throat> and for a number of the problems that we face in a, in, in a we, meaning the profession, face in a very practical way, such as forecasting, um, the tools, uh, certainly the time series tools that were available, say, 10, 15 or certainly 20 years ago, were ones that focused tremendously on very small models. And those models proved to be reasonably successful, uh, but they still had some trouble against judgmental forecasts and green book forecasts and things along those lines. And I think the big, one of the big challenges is, is there a way to take into account all of that information that, um, that, that is used in the heads of experts in a systematic way. And so, so, the big, so then the big challenge is, look, in real time or every month, there's you know, 1,000, 2,000 data, release, data series that are released. And we look at six. And those six are kind of interesting, but that leaves you know, uh, 1,994 left. And is there anything you can do about it? Well, um, <clears throat> so as it says here, the idea that you would want to look at all of those series is in some historical sense in econometrics, somewhere between radical and stupid. And the reason for that is anyone who's brought up on standard time series analysis learns uh, the principle of parsimony, which is uh, essentially uh, work with small models and few parameters and keep it simple. So as uh, Arnold Zellner would say, keep it simple, stupid. His principle is KISS. Um, so, you know, and the thing is quite obvious, even if you're running a VAR with just a few lags and six variables, you start to really have a parameter proliferation problem. So, uh, so, um, so the question then is, how do you uh, go ahead and try to tackle the large amount of data that's out there uh, and make progress? I'm going to talk about four areas that have seen work in this. Uh, the one that's seen the most work is in the area of economic monitoring and forecasting. And so I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in the most detail. But then at the end, I'm going to talk about extensions of that using, uh, for using uh, large data sets for structural vector autoregressions. The buzzword there is FAVAR. Um, and then IV estimation <coughs> and uh, DSGE estimation using, um, using large data sets. Okay, so uh, just to look ahead a little bit, um, it, it turns out that a very useful tool for a, a lot of this is dynamic factor models. Dynamic factor models were proposed by John Gavicki in his dissertation and uh, in their extension of factor models that were, say, prevalent at the time as psychometrics. Uh, Sergeant Sims have an early paper using this <coughs> as well. Um, there's, I should emphasize that although a lot of what I'm going to talk about is dynamic factor models, there's no particular a priori reason that dynamic factor models would have to be the best way to handle a lot of these questions. And indeed, in 10 years, we might decide 
or we might have decided that they're not the best way to handle these questions. Uh, it just turns out that when you look at a lot of different procedures, dynamic factor models happen to be a very robust, tractable, and uh, and, 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 and senses I'll make precise, uh, you know, bit of reliable uh, set of uh, a family of tools that 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 work well in this problem and seem to work uh, at least as well and in many cases better than some of the other tools you might think of uh, using. So that's what uh, there's going to be a lot of focus on that. But I want to emphasize that the focus on DFMs is not in any sense dogmatic or religious. It's more empirical based on you know this was one of several ideas that you could pursue and it turns out to be one that works pretty well. Okay, <clears throat> um, it, I should say also that there's a broader trend, which I hinted at uh, yesterday, and it will come up again uh, in many of the sciences, in the life sciences, uh, but in some of the other observational physical sciences, like astrophysics, towards moving to massively larger data sets. So uh, if you, apparently my understanding is that the newest chips for uh, the newest uh, sequencing chips have uh, the, uh, an individual site on this chip is called a probe. So you smear a bunch of DNA on it, and then it goes to these different probes. And these new chips have 30 million sites. So one observation on a sample of DNA, so if I take some DNA and I smear it on this, or I don't know, they, have, they do something like that, it comes back with a vector that's 30 million observations long. Okay, So then you do it for a bunch of different samples, and the data set gets pretty big pretty quickly. Um, we are not at 30 million observations, so the, the order of magnitudes here compared to astrophysics, where there's quite a few stars that they're studying, uh, and, uh, and, and genomics is really not, not anywhere uh, of, the same, of the same order. But it is the case that there's some pretty interesting tools that have been developed for these extremely large problems that are potentially of some interest, at least at a theoretical level, there are some interest, and I'll talk about them. I, I think, it, as it turns out, I'm going to come back saying that, you know, the tools developed for genomics don't work as dynamic as well as dynamic factor models, and maybe there's some reasons to think about that, but um, we'll be able to make that precise. Okay. So, why do you want hundreds of series? And so, let me talk about this dimensionality from curse to blessing, because uh, certainly, for those of you who went to graduate school a while ago, uh, and if you did take a time series course, boy, those were small models and principles of parsimony, and you really don't want to have large, uh, large regressions. So let me give you uh, an example. This is going to be, a, 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 in some sense, a toy example, but it's going to be a pretty good analogy for a lot of stuff and, that we'll be doing. So a toy example is where you would have a regression of Y on P. Okay, why am I using P? P for predictors and also for principal components, and you'll see why that is. But the key thing is that I want these to be orthonormal because that's going to make my calculations easy, just for this example, okay? So we're going to have an ortho orthonormal set of regressors so we don't have to worry about any covariances and uh, an error term. And these are going to be strictly exogenous regressors, and the errors are going to be IID normal. And that's going to make my calculations for this example simple. All right, so this is not a time series problem, even though I've got some sub-Ts, but it's going to be simple. Um, it, uh, it might be that if you have um, normal noise, that what this is a model of is these might be wavelet bases or something. These might be wavelets uh, bases that you're trying to do some uh, analysis of, uh, <coughs> of, uh, of, uh, of signals on. So this would be a model that comes up in signal extraction. Okay, um, okay so if you have, a, we're going to have a quad quadratic loss function, simple as could be. And what we want to do is we want to make a forecast. Want to make a forecast using data through cap T of the value of Y uh, tomorrow. So it's a single series, and we're going to think about this as being a large number of predictors, and you've got normal errors, and you have squared error loss. All right, so it's a standard problem, with the exception that we're thinking of P as being large. Now, one thing you learned in graduate school is that if you've got a ton of regressors, don't just throw them in OLS, because that's a bad idea. Okay? Um, it is a bad idea. Okay, so we're going to go through why it's a bad idea. You probably didn't think you needed algebra to know that's a bad idea, but we will do it anyway. All right. One way to make precise that it's a bad idea is to say that in a particular, so here's the loss you make. If this is your forecast 
one realization of your forecast, and this is the true value, that's the forecast error, the mistake you made. You square it, and that's how bad you feel. Okay? This is how bad you can expect to feel on average when you make forecasts using this procedure. Right? That's what is called the forecast risk, the so-called frequentist forecast risk. So it's how bad you expect to feel on average. All right? Now, I'm going to do a little bit of calculations. How bad you feel on average, well, there's two reasons you can feel bad. One is because the future just, you know, stuff happens, and you didn't know about it, and it's just in the future. Well, there's not much you can do about that. And the other reason you can feel bad is because you've used a lousy forecast, and your forecast, excuse me, you used lousy, a lousy, a lousy estimator of the coefficients. All right, so if you use a lousy estimator of the coefficients, well, that's going to make you feel bad because you're going to have a quadratic loss that's associated with your forecast based on this bad set of the four coefficients. Well, you can break these out because what happens tomorrow is unrelated to your, the data, that, the, the, what you used in the past to fit, the, the, to estimate the coefficients, the IID data, right? So what happens tomorrow is unrelated to the past, so these are two separate things. You can break them out. And you have two parts to your forecast risk. You have a part that you can do nothing about. That's just the way it is. And you have a part that you can do something about, which is uh, the risk associated with this particular estimator. The risk associated with this particular estimator is the inner product of the expectation of its inner product of this vector, or sometimes referred to as the trace MSE risk because it's the expected value of the trace of this, um, it, it's basically the MSE matrix. It's the trace of the MSE matrix, so it's the difference between your estimator and the true value. This isn't a variance, right? It's not the distance between the estimator and its expected value of that estimator. It's the expected value, the difference between the true value and the estimator itself. So this is an MSE. It has variance and bias built in. Yesterday, I suggested that this risk function is a risk function that is uh, not an appropriate one for point estimation in DSGE models, that we're actually not interested in some bias variance trade-off in DSGE models. We want to know what you know, the Calvo parameter is. We want to know it. Here, we actually couldn't care less about the coefficient on the ith predictor. We're not interested in that at all. We are interested in one thing, which is not feeling bad about our forecast, at least on average. All right, so that says that, um, that this is a reasonable, pretty reasonable loss function for us to think about. Since we can't do anything about tomorrow, at least we can do something about the user, the procedures we're going to use to estimate delta. Okay. All right, so that's our forecast. And I should mention that if you're following along on the slides, you've probably already noticed about 20 discrepancies between what's on the screen and what's on your slides because of a large number of typos. But um, since nobody seems to have been paying attention to the handwritten stuff or the, the stuff on paper, that's perfectly fine. The revised version will be on the web uh, in due course. Okay. So, okay, so, so let's just to make this thing concrete. Uh, uh, sort of obviously, if you knew the true value of delta somehow, uh, then, of course, you would use it, and this whole term would be zero. Your, ex your frequentist risk, your forecast risk would be, excuse me, your estimation risk would be zero because you haven't made any mistakes. So in that case, you would get what we can call a first-order efficient forecast, and it would be as good as if you knew the true ones, and you actually would know the true ones. If the coefficients were consistent, then, again, the estimation risk goes to zero, so you would have a forecast risk that doesn't go to zero. It goes to sigma squared epsilon, um, and the forecast would be first-order efficient. But, of course, um, now, now that's actually a reasonable thing to think about if you only have a, few, a handful of coefficients. So if the sample size is large and you only have a handful of coefficients, thinking about these coefficients being consistent for the true value is probably not unreasonable. But the situation we're going to be interested in is trying to exploit a large data set where there's a lot of information, potentially. Um, and in that case, um, OLS is not going to be first order efficient. And uh, in fact, because um, by the exogeneity of, of, these, uh, by, of the regressors and the fact that I assume normality, we have an exact distribution for, for what delta tilde, our estimator, is. The OLS estimator is exactly this distribution. It's the textbook X prime X inverse sigma squared uh, distribution. There's a, uh, there is a, there's not supposed to be a T here. It's P prime P, and there's not supposed to be a T here, and that's going to result, since this is orthonormal, that's going to result in a T there. So this equation is correct. 
All right. Um, okay, so that looks pretty good. I mean, it looks like you would have a variance getting smaller, but the trouble is there's a lot of these things. So if I compute the trace MSE, um, it's centered around the right thing. So in this case, there's no bias. And then I just compute the trace MSE. Well, that's going to be the trace of this matrix here because there's no bias term. Well, the trace of this matrix here is going to be sigma squared epsilon over T that pulls out. But then it's the trace of this N by N identity matrix. So I have to add up N terms. And I get N over T times sigma squared epsilon. So if I put that together, the forecast risk is N over T times sigma squared epsilon plus sigma squared epsilon, which gives me 1 plus this ratio, N over T, times sigma squared epsilon. Okay, so that's actually an instructive formula. What it says is that if, um, if you use a lot of, uh, of uh, variables, uh, predictors, then in fact you're going to get a forecast that can be potentially quite a bit worse than this um, first order efficient forecast. Right, so, um, okay, so a couple of other comments. As I mentioned, again, uh, I think the other day in passing, there's a couple of other reasons why you might want to think about OLS as not being particularly good. And one of them is this really amazing result by Stein in 1955, which said that OLS isn't admissible under this trace MSE risk, which is to say that this risk function, okay, this... This risk function here, if you look at this trace MSE risk function, it turns out that there exists other estimators that have a risk function that is uniformly no higher than. So it's below in some points, and it's perhaps the same in other points as OLS. And in fact, then, so that Stein proved that that exist in, existed in 1955. No, he proved that there must be such in 1955, and then he actually constructed one in 1960, and that's this James Stein estimator, which is a shrinkage estimator, and it shrinks towards zero. So in in the area of zero, since delta is being shrunk to zero, the James Stein estimator does better than OLS, and the interesting part of the calculation is that everywhere else it still does a little bit better, at least does no worse. So the James Stein estimator has a risk function that strictly lies below the OLS uh, risk function. So even if you only have three observations, three uh, three regressors, OLS is probably not a great idea. And we're going to be talking about having a 100 series. And so this is another reason to think that you can do, you can't, not only is OLS not a, not a good estimator, but there exist estimators that are going to be better. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so so that's so if you will, that's the curse of dimensionality part. Okay, so why am I doing this, right? I, you guys are probably all expecting me to like write down a dynamic factor model and to start talking about estimation of dynamic factor models and you know how to use binding to estimate the number of factors and all of that stuff. And here I am running rambling along about. They, about this risk business. And the reason is twofold. One is, you might not know this. It's supposed to be a class. The other, the other, reason, the other reason is I want to impress upon you because there's actually some theory behind all of this stuff. And it's not just people running stupid regressions and seeing what happens when they do simulated out-of-sample forecast exercises. Okay? So I'm trying... To, this literature can get a bad rap if you don't know that there's actually something going on behind it. All right, so, he, so here's, what's, here's part of what's going on behind it. Blessing of dimensionality. So, so I just gave the curse of dimensionality problem, but the curse of dimensionality wasn't a curse of dimensionality. It was just said we didn't use the right tools. All right. So let's use the right tools. And so here's a way to think about what the right tools are. So I'm going to adopt a local nesting in which, um, in which the parameters are local to zero. And the only reason I'm doing that in this setup is to prevent the R squared going to one. If, if you have a large number of predictors and each one of them is important, you're going to get the total sum of squares being totally e- just equal to the explained sum of squares. R squared is going to go to one in some, any of the asymptotics. So this is just a, a device uh, to keep the asymptotics from being unreasonable. And so, so these Ds now, or equivalent to the deltas, these Ds are what we don't know. If we knew them, we'd be in business. These are the coefficients uh, scaled. But what I am going to assume, this isn't an assumption. This is just a definition 
just take those d's. So take these d's, which are these two population coefficients that we don't know, divided by time square root of t, and just order them from smallest to largest, and then compute an empirical CDF. All right? So you guys know how to compute empirical CDFs. Uh, Mark, this uh, wasn't this an empirical CDF where you had empirical CDFs that you were, he was inverting. Okay, so that's an empirical CDF, except it would be kind of squiggly because it's a step function. All right, so you construct the empirical CDF of those things, and you call it G sub n, and that's just going to be a name. All right, and now I'm actually going to talk about estimators that have a particular uh, particular characteristic which is that they're invariant to the order in which you put the regressors. So when you are running state or rats and you have to type in a list of regressors, you get the same R squared whether you type uh, you know, consumption first and income second or whether you type income first and consumption second as the regressors. I see, pu- I see puzzles. <laughs> You probably are wondering, does there exist any estimators that don't have that property? <laughs> and they, they, there are. You could, you could write an estimator down that doesn't have that property, but I'm not going to consider them. Okay, that doesn't seem unreasonable to this audience. Okay. Um, all right. So, so, okay, so now I'm going to do a, some, a heuristic calculation. This heuristic calculation is formally justified in some references that I'll give. Here's the frequentist risk. Okay, the frequentist risk is the trace MSE loss, and so I've now written it out with a summation sign. Okay, and now I've done nothing of interest here, except I've divided, um, I've got a, I've, I'm, I'm dividing by N, because there's an N here, and then remember these deltas, I wrote these, these deltas are equal to DI over the square root of T, so I'm just doing local nesting. So uh, delta i is equal to di over the square root of t. I'm doing a local nesting here. So I can change the deltas to the d's, and I can pull out a t. All right. So I haven't done anything. I've just done just substitution. And now here, okay, here I actually it looks like I've done something, but I haven't done anything. This is a summation over the d's. The summation over the d's identically can be written as, a, as an integral with respect to this step function CDF. So this is, again, an identity. Okay? So this is just, this is writing this in. Okay. But now, this is amazing. Let's just look at this for a second. It's an integral of the expected loss with respect to this empirical CDF. We defined this yesterday to be the Bayes risk. Okay, the Bayes risk is the expected value over some CDF, over some prior, of a frequentist loss. This is the, this, so this is a Bayes risk. It's a Bayes risk. It's a very funny Bayes risk because it's a Bayes risk with respect to not a prior, but this empirical CDF of the Ds. So, so it's, but it, that's what it is. This is the Bayes risk. This is just a, so that's just a definition. The Bayes, we have defined the Bayes risk to be an integral with respect to some density. Or some in this D CDF, okay. This actually, this is, so I can say that this is a deep link, and the, and I can get away with saying that because it certainly isn't something that we thought of. It's this is an old deep link, due to Herbert Robbins between Bayes and frequentist inference. So so let's. So let's think about this. I want to find the estimator that's going to be the best possible, and I'm a frequentist, so all I care about is I want to minimize my frequentist risk. I've learned that OLS is a bad idea because there exist things like James Stein when I've got more than three regressors that are going to be better. And I don't have three, I have 100, so there's things that are going to be tons better than OLS. So I'd like to find that function of the data, delta tilde, that gives me the lowest frequentist risk. This is just a series of equalities. And what it says is that my problem, my, my frequentist problem, is actually the same as this Bayesian's problem. Now, this is a very strange Bayesian. This is a Bayesian like none we've ever met before, because your prior is actually the empirical CDF of the true Ds. But suppose you were that Bayesian, and suppose this were your prior. 
if you could solve your problem for the optimal Bayes estimator, it would actually be my optimal estimator. These are the same problems. That's the idea. So, so this, if we've solved the frequentist optimal estimation problem, and therefore the optimal forecasting problem under trace MSE loss. And the way to do it is to use the base estimator with respect to the CDF of these parameters. Now, there's a lot of special things about this, like the I, it turns out that the orthonormal regressors is really important to this argument. But, but I, I think this, so this is all, but it's all correct under what I've said here. This is, um, so then you could say, then you could say, what do you mean? A, what, so now, now we're going to, okay. This is the underlying idea of empirical Bayes. And so what empirical Bayes says is, all right, I want to solve a Bayes problem, but it's a very strange Bayes problem. It's a Bayes problem where I'm actually going to be solving it with respect to some empirical CDF of the underlying par true parameters. And if you can solve that problem, then that's going to be uh, the optimal uh, thing to do from this uh, forecasting perspective. Okay, so one way to think about this is that we're going to have a whole bunch of Bayesians come into the room, and all of these Bayesians, because they're subjectivist Bayesians, they all have their different opinions, and they're all going to produce an estimator, and we're going to choose the Bayesian with the best prior. <laughs> that's a stupid thing to think about. How can you choose the Bayesian with the best prior? And that's not a sensible thing to say if you're a subjectivist Bayesian, but it's actually incredibly sensible if you were at the Fed and you have a committee meeting and people come in with their models and their different priors and they keep coming in and again. And this guy, like, is always too pessimistic. You, eventually, you'd say, that's a bad prior. Your, your prior doesn't forecast very well. This person's always too optimistic. Their prior is just not very good. They're always too optimistic. They don't forecast very well. One of these people in this meeting, one of the people in this room, will produce the best forecast over time. It's logical to think of that person as having the best prior. So that's what empirical Bayes does, is it finds the prior that is going to produce the best forecast, that is to minimize the trace MSE loss. That's not how it does it, but that's the idea. So it's quite well posed to say that one person's prior is better than another's. It's not well posed from the perspective of a personal subjective Bayesian decision theory, but from the perspective of making forecast, it is. There's an empirical reality, which is the future, and you're trying to forecast it. OK. Um, so there's a bunch of really cool stuff about empirical Bayes estimators. Um, there's, there are certain senses in which they're asymptotically optimal. That was shown by Robbins. It turns out, so Efron and Morris in a really important paper in JAZA showed that the James Stein estimator is actually empirical Bayes. So this, this thing that I call this, shrink, this James Stein shrinkage estimator can be justified as empirical Bayes. So this gives you, it's going to give you an algorithm for constructing uh, good estimators. It, there's a couple of papers in the annals. This 2005 paper in the annals provides some um, strong properties about empirical Bayes estimators in a problem that's extremely close to the one that I just posed. Actually, the problem I just posed is a subset of the problems they consider. Um, there's a variety of methods to estimate G. I'm not going to go into those methods. I'm only going to talk about it in a very limited parametric way. Let's think about the following exercise. I, I had the committee meeting at the Fed where all the people came into the room with different priors. I'm going to constrain that committee meeting a little bit. I'm going to insist that everybody uses the same family of priors. That family of priors is going to be finitely parameterized. The parameters of that family of priors are called hyperparameters. Different people come into the room with different hyperparameters for their priors. One of them is going to win. Okay? Those, that's going to be the empirical Bayes estimator of the hyperparameters of the prior. So that's a parametric empirical Bayes. These wonderful theorems are all about non-parametric empirical Bayes. But as we all know, you know, you can get a long ways by doing things parametrically. And actually, you can do worse by doing them non-parametrically in practice. OK. Um, all right, so for some important lessons, one of the big lessons is that these shrinkage and Bayes methods can be very important in this framework. OK, so that's point one, blessing of dimensionality. Point two, the blessing of dimensionality. So instead of curse of dimensionality, blessing of dimensionality. And so now we are going to shift gears and we're going to talk about dynamic factor models, which might seem totally unrelated. 
But if you're still here and not catching a plane, towards the end you will see that these are not unrelated. Okay. So I'll, I'm going to talk about this in more detail later. So just live with this for the time being, okay? So here's the idea. We have a ton of series, I don't know, 100 or 200, and they are related to something that you can't observe, F. There's only a few Fs. Some people say there's one, some people say there's nine, but there's a few, num- a few of them. And then there's some other idiosyncratic noise. Sargent had a model like this in his 1989 paper where he said that you observe some things and there is an underlying state that was evolving and then there's measurement error because the statistical agencies just added error to data. That was his model. Um, And then this underlying F evolves over time. And I'm going to ignore that for the argument here. This model is a dynamic factor model. and This is what was first proposed by Gavicki in, in his thesis. And there were a number of papers that looked at this empirically. So England Watson figured out a way to estimate this in the time domain uh, using the Kalman filter. And then nobody did anything with it for a while. And then, uh, then there was a series of papers that used that algorithm uh, in the late 80s and, uh, and estimated this. And those were all on really small systems. So I guess Mark and I, what we had four variables. How many did you have with uh, Ingle? Five? Okay, and, and, and I think, uh, I think uh, Tom Sargent had six or something. These are small systems, like one factor and, you know, a couple of lags here and maybe modeling some dynamics here. And so you've got a pretty small number of variables. And, you know, it, this just took a long time to do the MLs. I mean, the MLs were slow back in the 19, back in 1990. And it was tempting to try to increase the number of parameters. I mean, you'd really like to go to a higher system because it would be interesting to see what would happen, but it just wasn't realistic. Okay? It wasn't a realistic exercise. So, so that looks like a curse of dimensionality. Okay? Well, so in a paper, in a, in a discussion of Quan Sargent, John Gavicki suggested that actually you could really do a lot better if you had a lot of series. And he didn't really propose any computational methods. It was all just kind of intuition. And his suggestion was that if you had a ton of series, you actually might be able to estimate F well. See, here's, look at this. And so Mark did the Kalman filter. And remember, there's the state estimation equation. If this is the state vector F in this setup, so this is the observer equation, and then this is the state and the state has you know, a dimension of 1 or 2 or something like that, and you only have a few series, you can use the common filter to estimate F, but if you only got a couple of series, you're going to be estimating it with error. So it'd be swell to know F. It'd be really interesting, but you're going to be estimating it with error using the common filter with a small number of series. Gavicki's intuition was that if you had a ton of series, that you'd actually be able to estimate F arbitrarily well. And I was there at that conference, and I thought he was crazy. Um, I don't know, maybe you thought. Maybe you, we edited the volume. I mean, we left the comment in, but we, I, I don't know. Okay, here's an example that makes, to shows that what he was saying makes complete sense. And this is following a paper by Forney and Reichland about 10 years ago. So now I'm going to make a really simple assumption. Suppose you have one factor, F, so this is a simple version of that dynamic factor model. And I'm going to say, do something totally idiotic. So we're not going to estimate something using the common filter in state space form by maximum likelihood. We're going to compute the average of the x's. Right? So what could be simpler? Well, compute the average of the x's, then it's just the average of this bit here. So just substituting things in. And now this ft doesn't depend on i, so I can pull that out of the summation and then diff- you know, pull the e's out of the summation. And what do I have? Well, I've got a term right here, which is an average of these E's. Well, these E's are idiosyncratic in the sense that they're not really from one series to the next. They're pretty much uncorrelated. You're just going to have a weak law of large numbers telling you that that thing's going to go away. And now if these lambdas, let's say these lambdas are positive on average, 
that's an identification assumption, so we might want to think about that. But let's just suppose, for the sake of this argument, that these are positive on average. Well, then this thing is just going to converge to some number, and there you have it. Okay? So it turns out that if you have a ton of x's, all you got to do is just average these suckers. Ton of x's, one factor, factor loading being positive on average. Just average these guys, and there you are. You're done. So you don't need the common filter and state space and ML or any of that stuff. You just got it. So this is a blessing of dimensionality. Right? You've got a non-parametric estimator that gives you this really interesting object, which is the factors. Now, this is not the most sophisticated estimator of the factors that you might ever find. It's just averaging these, but but it, this is all the this is going to this is the intuition for the you know the other estimators that are used. Okay, so that's. So that's two, two interpretations of blessings of dimensionality. Blessing of dimensionality number one being you can not just, not just is this, is not, not just is the frequentist problem equal to the base problem, but if the number of observations, the number of predictors is large, you're actually going to be able to solve the Bayes problem. That is, we're going to be able to estimate g sub n and therefore use that estimated value of g sub n to come up with a good, a, a good, uh, a good, uh, forecast. So that's the, that's, that's the blessing of dimensionality in the forecasting problem, and here it is in the DFM problem. All right, so now I'm going to talk about DFMs. So now this is probably where you thought I would start. Okay, so here's what uh, Gehrke wrote down in his dissertation. And he said, we're going to make a we're going to write down a little model here. And the model says that I've got a bunch of x's, and they depend on two things, something that's common, so a common factor, and then something that's not common, and these are idiosyncratic terms. And in the model that he wrote down, he, he added Gaussian errors and all that stuff, but he, in the model that he wrote down, he said that these idiosyncratic terms were not correlated from one x to the next x. So between x's, there is no correlation between these. What that means is that the entire co-movements at all leads and lags of the x's arises from this common component, in particular from this f. Now this f, because things evolve over time, it has some time series structure, and so we can just write that down as a VAR. Right? So it's got some time series structure, and it might appear in l- with lags. So you know some series might so in the jargon, load on the Fs with a lag. Others might load contemporaneously. Others might load with a distributed lag. And so that's the exact dynamic factor model. And that's actually what was, that's what's programmed up in the Kalman filter in those early 1980s uh, papers. Um, so a couple of quick comments. Comment number one is, um, just, I'll just be clear, we'll come back to this when I talk about SVARs or FAVARs. Uh, the factors themselves are only identified up to some uh, up to some rotation. So I could insert a matrix H H inverse. In fact, if you wanted, I could even make these a lag polynomials. But I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I could even make these lag polynomials in this setting. Um, these uh, I could insert a matrix H H inverse. Um, I could I could make these lag polynomials if I don't care about one sidedness. If I wanted to make this two sided. Um, so I can insert this HH inverse in here, and I'm going to get the same, uh, the, same, uh, dy- uh, the same product, lambda of L times FT. So, um, so there's a lack of identification that's involved in this setup. Uh, that actually is not important for any of the applications we're going to be doing So if we're, if for the first bit. So if we're talking about forecasting, we don't really care whether we have, in some sense, F or H times F. We only want the space spanned by F in a regression so we can project it on it. We don't really care. So this is not going to be of any importance at all. It's only going to be important if we start talking about, like, what's a structural shock and what do these Fs actually mean. And we'll talk about that at the very end when I talk about Favar and Bovan Giannoni. Second comment um, is that there's a spectral factorization. And uh, that spectral factorization is 
this, which is this is the spectral density matrix of the x's at frequency omega. And because these are, the f's and the e's are uncorrelated, that means that all autocovariances between the two at all these and lags are, uh, uncor- are zero. So that means that the variance, the autocovariance function of the x's is equal to the autocovariance function of this guy plus the autocovariance of this guy. So the Fourier transform of those is equal to the sum of those two Fourier transforms. That is to say, the spectrum is equal to the sum of these two bits. Um, and this is just using the, the, the usual spectral algebra. It says here that there's a common component uh, in the spectrum that's going to have reduced rank. So the, the dimensionality of F, the number of dynamic factors, we're going to call that Q. And so the rank of this bit of the spectrum is Q, and then this is a diagonal matrix, all right? a diagonal matrix, diagonal spectral density matrix. Uh, we're not going to exploit that in anything that we do, but that's just for those of you whose intuition is best guided by relationships in the frequency domain. I think there's one in the audience. <laughs> um, forecasting. So this is so this is pretty interesting, pretty important, and maybe obvious, but it's worth going through these steps. If you wanted to forecast one element of x, given past values of x um, and f, right, so this is the magic bit. If you're given past values of x and f, well, given this structure and, and it, the fact that it breaks down into this part that depends on the uh, f's and the part that's the idiosyncratic terms, that this forecast is just going to end up being a function of the f's and then your own uh, x. So, I'm sorry, I said that mathematically. This is really... The whole, this is, don't look at the math. Look at this equation. Look at this equation. If you want to forecast x, well, you're going to have some serial correlation in the error term, but this error term is unrelated to everything else. So that serial correlation in the error term can be, obtain, can be taken care of by throwing x as a regressor, as a lags of x in this equation. And then you've got the f's. So you can forecast x given the f's and g- given the x, f's and, its, and your past right, from this equation. And then you can ask the question, would I do better if I had any of the other x's? Like I've got, if I, I have 100, 199 other x's, would it be useful for me to throw them in this regression? And the answer is no. And the reason that the answer is no is that once you've got the f's, so a conditional on the f's, all you've got is these E's, and these E's are uncorrelated across all of the leads and lags with all of the other series. So there's no point in throwing on those other X's. All of the information, the dynamic factor model that you need for forecasting is embodied in this F. So if you could get that F, you're in business. Okay. All right, so now that's too strong. Um, there's that, that's making assumptions that there's no relationship at all in the idiosyncratic parts. Uh, even if you just take it literally at the measurement error story, you could imagine that there might be some series, uh, there are series that are measured with the same survey, and if the survey is done in a certain way, there's going to be correlation at survey error across the different series. Um, and, and, if, and if the measurement error is, has more uh, substantive content, then there might be correlation. The approximate dynamic factor model takes that into account. I'm going to give some particular assumptions that our statistical uh, implementations uh, or work, uh, the statistical implementations for the, of the dynamic factor model. But basically, the approximate DFM says that the, uh, that the, uh, um, that most of the variation in the matrix of X prime X is coming from uh, the, uh, or is coming from the, the factors. And um, there's a little bit that might be coming from the, uh, uh, the idiosyncratic terms. But asymptotically, that matrix, the, the variation in that matrix is dominated by the factors. Another way to say that is in the X prime X matrix, um, if there are Q fact, Q, uh, in, in, there are, if there are Q factors, this is, it's going to be dominated. The Q, I, there's going to be Q really big eigenvalues, and the rest of the eigenvalues are going to be small. Okay, so um, we're going to translate the dyna- static d- factor model into a uh, da- dynamic factor model into what's called the static form, which is actually going to be quite convenient for uh, estimation. So to do that, um, I'm going to take the uh, dynamic factor model and and okay, well here so 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 here's what I'm going to do, which is I'm going to take um, 
I'm going to take this, all this f and these lags, and I'm going to assume that lambda of L is finite order, finite degree lag polynomial. So if it's finite degree, say p sub f, then I can write all of these lag polynomials, lag polynomials out like this. They're the coefficients of the lag polynomials in the first equation. And then I can take all these f's and I can write them in a vector form like this. And then, of course, that means the first equation is just x1t plus the distributed lag of these f's plus e1t. All right? So I've just written this in first order form, and that's assuming that this has got a finite degree lag polynomial. So under that assumption, this is, I, I, here's what I've got, which I've just got xt is this matrix now, uh, which is n by r, and then this, uh, this excuse me, this vector um, here, which is the capital F, which is r by 1. Now, the way I've written it out, r is going to be equal to the number of little f's, which is q, times the number of lags, pf. Now, there might be some redundancy, or it might not be that much, but that's the most that it, that, that it could be. Um, so this is now going to be what we'll refer to as the dynamic, the static form of the dynamic factor model. And it's, uh, it's just written so it looks like it's a regular cross-sectional factor model. But it does have dynamics living inside of it in terms of the, the, the lag structure here. Um, in addition, I can take, the, um, I can take this uh, VAR for the little f's, and then in stacked form, that's just going to imply a VAR for the big f's. Um, and, uh, and so I've just written that down. And um, OK, so there's a dimension issue, which is that these f's are r by 1, and these eta's are q by 1. So that means I've got to have some matrix, which is going to be r by q, which is going to take this reduced number of eta's of the dynamic shocks and turn them dynamic factor innovations, excuse me, and turn them into innovations for the static factors. All right, so that's uh, that's the static factor model, and um, just to make it uh, simple, uh, I'm going to just make this a first order first uh, an VAR one, just so that it's easy to work with, and in most of the rest of the talk, that's just a VAR one, just to to make life simple. So there it is. There's the DFM in static form. And this DFM in static form is now just looks like a standard state space common filtering exercise. So, uh, so, so that's, that's, uh, that's what it is. Um, you can put the whole thing in the, in state space form. Uh, if you want to model the dynamics of the, uh, of the idiosyncratic terms, which will be useful, you could imagine that those follow autoregressions, so I can then stack the, Fs, the E's and their lags as much as needed so that that autoregression can be written in first order form. And so that's the first order form of that autoregression. H is now going to be a matrix that takes these um, N uh, idiosyncratic innovations, uh, zeta, and then transform and, and basically has a bunch of zeros in it so that this is the first order form of the uh, of the, uh, of the autoregressive representation for the E's. should emphasize that because the E's are supposed to be uncorrelated across each other in the exact factor model, that this matrix D is diagonal. Right? So these are not, it's not a VAR for the idiosyncratic terms. It's just a whole bunch of ARs. Right? And so, so then this puts the whole thing, just for completeness, this puts the whole thing into a state equation here and uh, an observer equation right here, and uh, you're ready to apply the uh, common filter. And so that's how, that's how these common filter algorithms were originally done, or versions of this is one way to set it up. Okay. Yes, I, this just is what I said. Okay, okay so... so So, so, so just to step back, let me summarize. We've written down the dy dynamic factor model. Uh, we did just a few things. It's a linear model. And it did just a few things to put it in exactly the state space form that you saw for the common filter when Mark presented that uh, a couple of days ago. And since it's now in that form, that means we can run the common filter, and among other things, we can compute the likelihood. Uh, if we have the likelihood, we can then maximize it. And so this can all be estimated. Uh, these parameters can be estimated by maximum likelihood. And, uh, and that's, that's what was done. 
um, that got uh, sort of frustrating. Qua and Sargent uh, actually were able to estimate a system with 60 variables, but they did it in a very, very special structure that, um, that allowed them to do some tricks that were not able to be, were not readily generalized. So although it looks like it's a big structure, computationally this was, I mean, not, it was uh, certainly non-trivial, but it, it wasn't really moving all the way towards a, a full uh, s- system. Okay, so, but in, of course, that was a while ago, and computers are better. So I'm going to talk a little bit about comp- uh, MLEs right now. Um, computers are better. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting developments since there was, there was in this intermediate period a fair amount of work on alternative non-parametric estimators of the factors, and those estimators are actually pretty good. What that means is that you can now get, using those preliminary alternative estimates of the factors, you can actually use that to get pretty good starting values. So if you, you don't know these factors here, but if you actually, but if you could, you know, you had some reasonable estimate of the factors, then you could get a pretty reasonable estimate of phi, and you could get a reasonable estimate of these, of, the, of, of maybe of G, and then you could get a reasonable estimate of, uh, in your regression, let me put them in regression form here, you could get a reasonable estimate of the factor loadings by regressing um, F on lambda, and then you can take the residuals and you can fit an AR2 to those. So all of those parameters can be obtained using very simple OLS type algorithms once you have uh, once you have estimates of these factors. So you can so because we now have procedures that I'll talk about in a minute that give good estimates of the factors, um, you can get quite good starting values uh, for the. Um, in, in fact, you get can consi- you can get consistent starting values for the uh, for the estimate for the uh, common filter. So. Um, so, uh, and, and then I guess a final point is there's some recent work here by Jungbacher and Koopman um, that provides an additional speed up. It's actually a clever projection device that, um, that simpli- that's churned some of the common filter updating equations into just regressions. So, um, so there's additional, additional advantages that you can get um, instead of having to work with the, the otherwise large matrices that would be involved. Um, there's some theory that's been developed uh, about ML estimation of the of um, of these systems when you have large uh, of dynamic factor models uh, when you have large um, numbers of uh, of series. Um, and the relevant paper is this one by Dos, Giannoni, and Reichlin, um, and uh, they show that you could that these MLEs are going to be uh, consistent or more, most I will be more precise than that. What, I, what they show is that you will get consistent estimates of the factors by estimating those parameters by MLE and then uh, by, um, by using the uh, common filter to estimate the factors. Um, so I'm going to talk about, there's some, some empirical evidence, but I'm going to talk about that once we go through some of the other estimation methods. Another comment about the MLE and the state space formulation of this. Uh, the, the state space formulation is, has a couple of advantages. Um, one of them is, or a couple of nice features, I should say. And one of these is that is it's possible to accommodate a large number of data irregularities. So if you have data that occurs, uh, some monthly data and some weekly data, for example, or some month, some daily data, you can actually set up. But the then, column. you know, some days you might observe, uh, you might observe some macro variables, and those macro variables at those days, the observer, equ- this being the observer equation, at those days, the observer equation is going to be related to the factors, but only in a way that links it to the variables that we're actually observing today. So the observer equation is going to have. Uh, this uh, a, a, a version of lambda that's going to be varying over time depending upon whether we see it or not. And that allows you to go ahead and compute a likelihood and run the common filter based on the data that you have available today and in the past, even though the dimensionality of that data is going to be changing depending upon the day that you have it. And moreover, you can do things like, say, uh, suppose you um, have temporally aggregated data, so you want to model consumption as a flow, and what you observe is consumption over the month. You could say, I'm going to average 
uh, the factors over the last month, and I'm going to observe once every 30 days. I'm going to observe the average of uh, the uh, of the average of the Fs every 30 days. So you can set up a lot of things like that in the common filter. Um, that um, that's not new. It, that you can do that is is described in Harvey's uh, 1993 book. His book um, certainly older than that, but um, Harvey has a ton of papers on this. Uh, but it was all in, it was implemented in this context using a large system by uh, these three authors uh, using ir- irregular mixed daily uh, data. And the nice thing about that is that if you once you have the parameters of the uh, DSG, excuse me, once you have the parameters of the DFM, uh, you um, every day when new data is are released, you just like can put those in, and then you run the Common filter for updated for that one day, and you have an, a new estimates of the state based on that day's information, and those feed into new estimates of your 200 series. So, like you could, you have in real time updates of everything you'd want to know based not just by some kludgy method like Chow Lin or something like that, but by in a completely internally consistent mechanism that's going to give you an updated piece of information on all of the series that you're interested in. And um, so I, 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 Domenico, you guys, did, you were involved with the one, doing this sort of thing at the Fed, isn't that right, with Lucrezia? So I don't know if that still exists. Is that actually running, or was that a hypothetical trial experimental system? OK. So. I mean, once these get running in real time, then they know they disappear from the literature. But uh, but 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 these, you know, this this is a sort of thing that can be very uh, valuable because it provides a complete and internally consistent update on a large number of series. Okay. All right. So okay, if that's estimation MLE. All right. All right. So here's the chronology. Right. The chronology was. The original stuff that Gavicki did was was spectral, and then um, and then Engel and Watson figured out how to do this in the time domain by the common filter, and then everybody gave up on the common filter because it was too hard using the computers that we had, and so then some other procedures were shown to work, and those are principal components families of procedures. But now the computers have gotten fast enough that we're kind of back to doing MLE on these really huge systems. And, but that's very recent, just the last few years. And I think that this Koopman Jungbacher thing is going to help a lot in terms of making it implementation, implementable. So now I'm going to talk about the inter, in that intermediate set of procedures, which is principal components related procedures. So here's principal components. So let's, for the time being, think of this as a regression model. Or some model. I don't know. It's some model. I'm going to say, we're going to treat f as a, we're going to to treat lambda as a parameter and f as a parameter, which sounds idiotic. But let's just do that and see what happens. Okay? So I'm going to say I want to fit this by nonlinear least squares, because I can't do OLS. If I knew lambda, I could figure out f. If I knew f, I could figure out lambda. I don't know either of these. But I'm going to do, say, some nonlinear least squares thing to try to figure out lambda and f. It looks like a regression problem, so why don't I minimize the sum of squared residuals? All right, so I'm going to minimize the sum of squared residuals. And lambda and f are parameters, whatever that means. I'm estimating them as parameters, so they're parameters. They're theta. Well, this problem actually has a really nice structure, and I'm going to concentrate out f. So if I knew, let's imagine that I knew lambda, then loosely speaking, assuming that I can do my matrices with the right transposes and all of that in my head, f hat is going to be lambda prime lambda inverse lambda prime x. So the residual from that is going to be x minus lambda prime inverse, lambda prime lambda inverse lambda prime x. So the sum of squared residuals from that is going to be 
x prime the projection on the lambda matrix x. Well, I've gotten rid of f, which is fine. If I knew lambda, I don't know lambda, but now I can solve this problem. I can say minimize this projection sum of squared residuals over all possible values of lambda. And you look at that and you say, that doesn't look very fun. That would be a big grid search. But if you do a little bit of algebra, it doesn't have to be a big grid search. So minimizing this projection on the orthogonal matrix to lambda is the same as maximizing the explained sum of squares. And now I remember my matrix tricks from graduate school where I can take the trace and do transposes and pull things to the side and it's the same answer. And the advantage of that is I got all of these summation things in the middle and so it's, I want to find the lambda that minimizes this inner product. Well, this lambda prime lambda, the minus one half prime lambda is normalized so that this thing together is itself prime itself is equal to the identity matrix. So I can replace this or at least throw away this and impose that side constraint and I say I want to maximize lambda prime times sigma xx lambda subject to this restriction. And that's solved just by being the first R eigenvectors of this matrix and that gives then f hat as lambda hat prime xt is the first principal components, first R principal components. So, 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 so the reason I did that, principal components is not new and nonlinear least squares is not new, but in some sense principal components sounds like this stupid algorithm that you never really wanted to use in SAS, but it actually has a very sensible origination. So the consistency of principal components in the exact static factor model with t fixed and intending to infinity was shown by Connor and Karachik. And um, then uh, there was a, there's a pretty substantial literature now s- over the last 10 years that's been looking at uh, results for estimation in the approximate dynamic factor model in static form. Um, here are some typical conditions. One of them is that you assume the f's are well-behaved. Uh, another is that you assume the lambdas are well-behaved. Um, so there's obviously some identification conditions lying around in there, but, um, but it, the, the, it's basically these are definitions that you have the right number of factors. So if you have R factors, it makes sense that these things would be true. This is the approximate DFM that says that the E's are going to be weakly dependent over time and across series. So there might be some correlation across series, but it's not going to be so much that it's driving the covariance of all of the series. It's just maybe a, a block of series, like you know, maybe there's some consumption series that are related or something in the same survey that's related. And then the Fs and the Es are uncorrelated. And then um, the asymptotics here are ones that have N and T tending to in infinity. And this is going back. This asymptotics works. Remember the, the, the um, uh, forney Reichland take the average of the Xs? That worked because N was going to infinity. Okay, this stuff works because N is going to infinity. This is this blessing if you will, of dimensionality. Okay, so there's some results. So uh, for the DFM, uh, they're consistent. Uh, You can use F as a regressor. Um, The original proofs were kludgy and they got fixed up and that's that's not fair. The original proofs were good, but it turns out you can get better rates. And so these guys got better rates for using things. And there's also now distribution theory for things like confidence bands for predicted values. Let me make a comment about that. Confidence bands for predicted values are different than confidence than than prediction regions. Mark showed you this fan chart, right? That's That's not a confidence band for predicted value. That's the entire range of uncertainty that includes not just your predicted value and its uncertainty, but it includes all of the other bad things that could happen in the future. Right, so pr- confidence bands for predicted value are, of course, of some interest, but in forecasting, we want to have the distribution, the conditional distribution of y uh, in, the, in the future, which is not just the estimation part of it, but it's the bad things that can happen. Okay? Um, it is possible in principal components to um, handle data irregularities, and there's some uh, um, 
uh, I believe this has actually been used once or twice. There's a, um, some details about how you can do that in an appendix of uh, one of our papers. Um, although arguably, uh, the data irregularities are handled probably more systematically, certainly more elegantly, in, in the common filter setup. And they can be used in the common filter setup in this real-time way. Okay, so that's principal components. Now, principal components, um, there's some other methods that have been proposed, so let me just go through those other methods that are in this family. These other methods are, so this is, this is easy. To, this is really easy to understand. So I motivated principal components, not motivated, but derived principal components as the solution to a least squares problem. Okay? Those E's, what if those E's were heteroscedastic, heteroscedasticity? Then you might not want to do least squares. You might want to do weighted least squares. Or if there's a little bit of correlation in the E's with each other, you might want to do generalized least squares. And so that's what it does. Right? So that's... So instead of the identity matrix in there, why don't we put in a different weight matrix? Okay. And so that's just GLS. And it turns out this, you just go through the algebra, this is also an eigenvalue problem. It's an eigenvalue, this is a generalized eigenvalue problem. And the only difference is that now we're looking at um, the first R eigenvectors, not of the X's, but of this GLS transforma transformation type thing. And so these are the uh, what's called generalized principal components with respect to this weighting matrix. Um, that, uh, what I just gave you was infeasible because that assumed that you knew this. Um, the tricky part here is thinking about the best way to estimate these. And the reason I say, you normally when you, you say you know, you go through feasible GLS and you say now you just estimate it and you move on. It's not totally obvious in this circumstance because this is an n by n matrix. This is one big matrix. All right? So an n by n matrix has uh, order n squared elements in it. And if you've got a 100 series, you're talking about a serious number of elements in this matrix. So there's a couple of ways that you can kind of get at this. And they're discussed in the literature. Probably one of the simplest ideas is um, impose the exact DFM structure. So in the exact DFM structure, these E's are uncorrelated with each other. And, um, and that says that this is a diagonal matrix. And you've changed it. You, since you zeroed out all of those off-diagonal terms, you only have n things to estimate. And so that's easy. And Bovan and Ning suggested doing that. <clears throat> uh, there's some other methods uh, that have been proposed. Uh, um, there's a particular procedure using dynamic principal components um, that these guys proposed in 2005 uh, to come up with a weighting matrix. Um, so, so the approach we looked at, uh, so, so if you think about this as a GLS problem, we're only doing, G, we're, there's, actually, uh, there's actually three dimensions in which you, want, you might want to think about GLS. And so one dimension you might think about it is the heteroscedasticity. Another dimension is the cross-correlation across the E's. But there's actually a third dimension, which is the time series dimension, which is that the, in, the, in the exact EFM, the E's are going to have some dynamic structure. So, you, so you, if you really wanted to be serious about this GLS, you'd somehow be doing heteroscedasticity and a little bit of cross-correlation and serial correlation, and that's a lot. And so we don't do all of that. Um, but we do. this one focuses on the serial correlation aspect. So you can do a cochrane orcutt type transformation to the data and then use that um, as a way to estimate, estimate the factor. So there's a variety of things that are floating around out there. Um, there's, uh, so that's the, uh, let's see. Um, this is, This is out, out of order. Uh, I mean, I'll come back to this. Let me go through the slides in, this, in, the, in, the, right or, in the order that the slides are, are written, and then I'm going to come back to this. So a logical question. A logical question 
is I've presented a whole bunch of different things. I've presented MLE and principal components and generalized principal components, and there's at least three flavors of generalized principal components, and what is a poor practitioner to do? And that slide should be next, but it's actually in about seven slides. So just deal with it. Okay. All right. So, so let me, once you've got these factors, once you've got these factors, um, what can you do with them? And going back to the original motivation, is that in some sense these factors are just efficient statistics for all of the other x's in the exact dynamic factor model. So if you knew the, if you're trying to make a forecast, if you're trying to run a VAR with 200 series, but somebody said that you actually among, that you actually have some of those of these factors, you say this is great, I can throw away all but the factors, and um, maybe it, you'd want to use your own the own, own lags, but you don't need any of the other series. So you can just put them in as regressors. Um, one of the theoretical results I mentioned, uh, both in the, like in the Stockwatch in 2002 paper and the Binding 2006 paper, uh, is provide certain conditions under which these factors are uh, useful as uh, predictors. Um, one thing that I, I guess I didn't emphasize, but I, I would like to emphasize, is that Is that you? It's really you. Really have to. This is really hard. You really have to. This is so different than almost all of other econometrics in the sense that the ends that we're talking about here are really big. Okay, there's a large number of series, and the asymptotics and the th- econometric theory reflects that. Remember when we were talking about many weak instruments. All right, so, or if you're talking about optimal GMM estimation through sequences of things. Or you, so think about all of, those, all of those econometric seminars that you left in the middle of. <laughs> right. you would, the moment you left was when they wrote up these technical conditions where we're going to look at spline estimators where there's k splines, and we're going to assume that k tends to infinity, but it doesn't intend, tend to infinity any faster than, excuse me, any faster than the cube root of n. Okay? Or you were at a spectral density estimation thing where they had the bandwidth tending to infinity but the bandwidth divided by the sample size, what, are, what, is, what is it supposed to be? Cubed again? Cubed. Tends to zero. Or it's you know, some kernel estimation seminar where the, you know, where the bandwidth of the kernel, well, this is going to be a little bit different, but it's a, the bandwidth of the kernel has to tend to zero, but it has to, if this is in the reverse, in B and uh, cubed or something like that tends to infinity. I, I probably got that one backwards. Okay. So, uh, no, I, I gave that. I, I will, the bandwidth one is too hard. That's too upside down. Okay. So, but it's the same idea. Or the optimal instruments. We're getting back to, I, to GMM. The optimal instruments, they say we're going to come up with something that's equivalent to GMM and we're going to do it by approximating the score using some sequence of instruments that's going to give us projections and this is so cool and the sequence is going to have the number of instruments tending to infinity but the number of instruments over uh, the sample size uh, cubed tending to zero. And in many weak instruments, the many weak instruments thing, remember how I did the sequential asymptotics where you had, I, I took t to infinity and I got my weak instrument lambda plus z v prime z u over lambda plus z v prime lambda plus z v. And then I went down here to go to infinity, taking k to infinity, and I let k tend to infinity. But for that to be justified, I had to have k over t to the fourth go to zero. Okay, so. All of these things are pre- fake infinities, okay? 
So you're supposed to have, it's like what Mark was saying this morning, you know, you're supposed to have bandwidths that have sort of infinite lags, but they have to be infinitely small by a big ways to be able to estimate them precisely. These are all fake infinities. This couldn't be more different. The results for by Ning are n squared over t tends to infinity. N over uh, n squared over t tends to infinity. Have I got this right? Let me get the result. Let me get the rate properly. Okay. Here we. Okay. Now, n squared over t tends to infinity. Okay. So that's a by Ning rate. Think about that. It's just an enormous number of n. So, you know, if you have 100 observations, you should be looking at a lot of n's. Now, this is just how the asymptotic works, and it, it doesn't really tell you what the scale is supposed to be. So the only way to really figure that out is to do Monte Carlo simulations. And when you do Monte Carlo simulations on spectral densities, and you look at sizes when you use optimal Andrews things, you get rejection rates of 40%. Isn't that what we had this morning? But when you do Monte Carlo's here about whether or not it really works to estimate the factors and whether it really works to run regressions with factors as predictors, and you have a couple hundred observations and 400, or you have 50 observations and 100 series, it works great. It works great. And that's, that's just a statement about Monte Carlo. It's not a statement about empirical reality. So it's a completely different world, completely different world. OK. No, where are we? That was a digression. Oh, yeah, multiple horizon forecasts. This gets to this really interesting topic of direct versus iterated forecasts. <laughs> I could tell. I was sitting in the back, and I could tell that everybody really perked up during that part of the conversation. <laughs> when Max approached us, when Massimiano approached us with this, pro- with this project, we just thought this was so stupid. It was such a boring project. But it turned out to be pretty interesting, I have to say. There's two ways to do this. So there's two ways to do your direct versus iterated forecasts. And, and actually, I don't think that we have a good sense, we meaning the people who are involved with this empirically, in the context of DFMs as to which of these actually works better. And one way is you could take your factors that you've estimated, say, by principal components or dynamic principal components or maximum likelihood, excuse me, by maximum likelihood or generalized principal components or principal components, and you could use them as regressors in an H step ahead regression. Nothing stops you from doing that. You can include lags of your own variable. This is what most of the literature does. Another thing you could do is you could just do one step ahead, and then you could iterate. And this kind of has a VAR-type flavor. It seems to be restricted because there's no feedback from the x's to the f's. There's not supposed to be, by the way, right? Because if you know the f's only, you don't need the rest of the x. That's the point, right? So you don't need all those x's in there. Um, but you could iterate this. And I don't think we have good empirical evidence one way or the other as to whether one or the other of these is better. This is almost, this is the majority, vast majority of the empirical work. Uh, one, if you're doing this thing in the context of the, I'll tell you one disadvantage of the direct forecast that I don't think Mark mentioned is that every horizon is a different, is a different forecasting regression. And that means you have this, it's not completely internally consistent. It's not all generated from the same model. It's, there's all these different models. And one nice thing about this is that it's all from one model. And if you're doing this in the common filter, it all just naturally is going to come right out. So um, I think that's something that somebody who wants to write a really uh, fascinating uh, paper uh, can investigate whether the director iterated forecasts are uh, actually working uh, better empirically. Okay. And you can evaluate these using the data sample methods. All right, let me talk briefly about uh, something called dynamic principal components. So one of the things that was developed, okay, so here's the, remember the chronology. 
uh, Gaverke in his thesis did this all by spectral methods. Sargent and Sims did it by spectral methods. Problem with the spectral methods is you could do things like try to figure out the number of, con- of factors, but you couldn't actually estimate the factors. You couldn't use them for forecasting. All you could say is at the bottom, at the end of the paper, you say, so the rank of the spectral density matrix is 2, which is not you know, it's not the most interesting thing to say. It's all right, but there's more you'd want to say. So then you go to the time domain things and the MLEs. The MLEs kind of hit a wall computationally. And then people are thinking about other stuff. Some of them were principal components, but one of the other things uh, that was thought of uh, by the, um, for this Forney, Holland, Lippi, Reichlin uh, uh, group, um, the Euro collaborators, uh, was using a device that was developed um, back in the 60s by uh, David Brillinger, and, um, and that's called dynamic principal components. Uh, dynamic principal components uh, is actually um, principal components analysis done in the frequency domain, and so you estimate the, the spectral density matrix now as a function of omega of the entire x's, and then you do principal components frequency by frequency, because at each frequency we saw that there's this spectral decomposition that says there's a, all the common, the cross things have this reduced rank matrix plus then this diagonal piece. And so you can, that's the structure of principal components in the time domain in the classic um, uh, psychometric setup. And so instead, you just flip it around, you do it in the time domain, in the frequency domain, and that's going to give you these so called dynamic principal components. And then you can do some inversion and actually get back stuff in the time, dom- in the, uh, in the time domain by doing, um, since you've essentially, so one way to think about that is that this is not the way it's actually done, but this is a way to think about it. Mark showed you that you can take those matrices that he called H and you can factorize the entire covariance matrix of the data. So by and those H matrices were the discrete Fourier transforms, so you go to the frequency domain. So um, you could go H inverse and going from the frequency domain to the time domain. So once you've parameterized the, um, the entire autocovariance function in this reduced rank way in the frequency domain, you can H inverse everything. You have the time domain uh, full covariance matrix of the entire uh, data. And since you, if you then make assumptions of normality, once you've got all of the data and the full covariance matrix, you can come up with any conditional expectation that you want, and you can um, think about expectations of the factors. Now, that's not actually how it's done. That's just how I think about it, but that's not, that's not how it's done in practice. Um, the problem with this method, and I think the reason that the method isn't used much anymore, uh, is that, um, is that uh, it produced two-sided estimates of the F. So if you want to think about any application where you'd want to have a one-sided series, like forecasting or, or uh, 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 any, you know, any, any application like that, uh, it, it's, you're not going to get the, you're not going to, you're not going to actually get this one-sided, um, the, you're not going to get the dating right. It's going to include future information. And that's problematic for certain, for most applications. Um, it is the case that these, um, that this factorization can then be used to uh, do some, uh, to provide potentially improved uh, generalized principal components estimates, and that really, whether that helps or not, uh, is uh, is essentially a Monte Carlo uh, and uh, empirical question, which we'll look at. Okay, in fact, now here's the slide that I was looking for, which is what should you use? So, what's the poor practitioner to do? We've got a whole ton of things. We've got MLEs, principal components. Uh, generalized principal components, of which I've listed three flavors, and there's actually more flavors than that. And so what's the poor practitioner to do? And that's a, a good question. There's a little bit of theory. Okay, so here's piece of theory number one. Piece of theory number one is, hypothetically, let's just suppose that you knew, just suppose that you knew the parameters of the dy- dynamic factor model. Okay, just suppose you did. Then the optimal thing to do is actually quite straightforward. At least in the exact dynamic factor model, you should estimate the minimum mean squared estimate of the factors, and that's obtained by running the Kalman filter. Right, so it's clear that the Kalman filtering approach is the best way to estimate the factors in the exact dynamic factor model. Um, that's assuming that you know the parameters. There isn't any theorem 
that I'm aware of that says that the best way to fi- the best estimates of the Fs are obtained by applying the common filter using the MLEs. It sure stands to reason that that's a sensible thing to do, but there's no theorem that says that. The only piece of evidence that we have at a theoretical level is a comparison by Choi, uh, where he computes the compares the asymptotic variance of principal components to the asymptotic variances of generalized principal components under, um, under the exact dynamic factor model structure. So you assume exact dynamic factor model, and then on the one hand you do principal components, and on the other hand you use generalized principal components. And he does it for the infeasible principal components, and he finds that you get a smaller covariance matrix. I don't think that you, you, know, you, get, you get more precise estimates using the, the generalized principal components. I don't think that that's a very surprising result, because if you knew... Remember, the generalized principal components uses the covariance matrix of the errors inverse. If you knew that, then sort of it's, it seems kind of obvious that that's what you'd want to do to estimate the parameters. And so it's not a big surprising result that you would get those improvements. I think it's much less obvious, because that's such a huge matrix, it's less obvious that if you estimated it, you would necessarily get those improvements. I, I think it, it's, I suspect that this work, this, this is not impossible. I suspect somebody could do this. I suspect somebody could work out the algebra. And I think that would be a great project for a diligent graduate student. Okay. It's a good question. There is some simulation evidence. A lot easier than the algebra is the simulations. Um, and uh, Choi produces uh, some, and although his theory only does for infeasible GLS, he actually produces some results for feasible GLS also. And uh, what he finds is that, um, that for feasible GLS, it's one of these things on the one hand and on the other hand, and depending upon the design, and depending how big N is, sometimes it's better to do principal components, and sometimes it's better to use uh, feasible um, uh, feasible GLS, and there's really no clear bottom line from those simulations. There's a nice simulation study in this Doe's, Giannone, and Reichland uh, paper, and they look at principal components and uh, principal components. Um, oh, I didn't say this. This is a really cool idea that that makes just so much sense in in that that uh, that's developed in some of the in some. One of the Euro people's, I have a reference in the slides, one of the Euro group's papers, which is just doing a, what they call a two step. All right, the two step is you estimate the factors by principal components. You then regress the X's on the factors to get the lambdas. You take the residuals, you get the E's. You, with the E's, you can, by OLS, you can estimate the autoregressive coefficients. In the F, if you've got the Fs, you can regress the Fs on the past, and you can get the factor state dynamics. You take all those equations, you plug them in, those coefficients, you plug them in, and now do a single pass of the common filter. Don't do any parameter estimation, but just do a single pass of the common filter to get an updated estimate of the Fs. So that's really easy, because you're not doing any nonlinear optimization for the parameters, and the one pass of the common filter is no big deal. And so that's something they look at also, and then they look at the full uh, ML of everything uh, using an EM algorithm. And what they look at as this measure is a measure that uh, we've look, we looked at before in some of our earlier work and a lot of folks have worked, looked at, which is basically if you have a, if you have a bunch of Fs, uh, what you'd like to do is you'd like to, you'd like to have the, pre- the estimated Fs equal the true Fs. And you can think about projecting the estimate the true f's on the estimated f's and then sort of this is sort of like a trace r squared for a regression of the of the of the true f's on the estimated f's and you'd like this r squared to be 1 and um, okay so so what do we have here and now we're looking at ratios of trace r squareds so this is a table from these 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 guys Doge, Giannone, and Reichlin And C 
So this is the ratio of the trace R squared for maximum likelihood to the trace R squared for principal components for one of the models that they're looking at. And the really interesting result for this model is that the principal components and maximum likelihood are giving just about the same trace R squared. Okay. This is the ratio of maximum likelihood to two-step. You see, you, so for n equals 10, so this, this, it, it, this makes so much sense. Look at t equals 100 and n equals 10. All right, so t equals 100 and n equals 10 is kind of not quite, you know, for the old literature it was like n equals 5, but this is kind of in the flavor of the old literature. And maximum likelihood is doing better than principal components. And in fact, maximum likelihood is doing better than two-step. But as you start going to infinity or getting bigger, principal components is doing just fine. And there's, they have other simulation results, and th they have this, sort of the same flavor in their other simulation results. So um, I, I take that as evidence that, um, I mean, the ML is clearly giving some improvements. There's no question about that for the small ones. It certainly is never hurting anywhere. Um, on the other hand, the, the actual gains when you have a large number of series seem to be modest in these simulations. And that, you know, this is just a simulation, so it, it could be more substantial in other simulations. Okay, so Bovan and Ning have, uh, have um, also some simulation evidence um, comparing uh, principal components to generalized principal components. And so I have a table of results. And so the columns to prepare, to compare is this, I, th I don't know what, I don't, this column here. So I looked in their paper, and this is the column for, for principal components with an unrestricted regression divided by an autoregression as a benchmark. And this is generalized principal components uh, using, this is the particular covariance matrix scheme they're using is just the weighted least squares version, the heteroscedasticity version. And if you compare these columns, so at one, at one step, at, let's look at four steps ahead. Uh, in this simulation that's a calibrated one off of real data, uh, 0.64 means that you're doing much better relative to an autoregression by using this particular procedure. You're getting improvements of about 40%, 35%. And if you use generalized principal components, it's 0.67. If you use regular principal components, it's 0.64 for um, income, personal income. It's 0.69 versus 0.69 for MSMTQ, which must mean something. Uh, it's 0.69 to 0.7. I should know what that is. Manufacturing and trade sales. Um, LP NAG is non-agricultural employment, and you get just a tiny improvement by using principal components. You know, if you look at this, oh, here's a case where using regular principal components at the six-month horizon for personal income isn't as good as using the generalized principal components. Basically, there's no difference. Okay, so in their simulation, you know, you can split hairs and maybe look at second decimals or third decimals, but basically, there's no difference. Okay. Um, so that suggests that principal components and, ge and generalized principal components make really pretty modest difference. I'd, I'd say that in our work, we 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 would basically ag agree with that. Um, there's some empirical evidence. Um, the broad summary of the empirical evidence is that these things really have fairly similar performance, the different flavors of principal components. I guess one, when, one of the, when these, so this is more an impression on my part rather than, this is an imp impressionistic, which is it seems as though in those, the, the versions that are estimating a ton of parameters for the feasible GLS that those can be prone to outliers in both directions, sometimes particularly good, but sometimes particularly bad. Now, when I say particularly, it's, 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 it's not, we're not talking about huge outliers. We're talking about, you know, two standard deviation blips in, in, in you know, 0.89 compared to a 0.94 or something like that. But, but there seems to be more variability in the generalized principal components approach. Um, here's, a, here's one nice picture and so this one now is comparing uh, principal components versus the filter. This is one realization from a paper by uh, Reese and Watson, which is comparing one, uh, one realization of a filtered ML 
estimate of a sing in a single dynamic factor model with uh, a, a bunch of price series to a principal components. And the one reason this is kind of interesting methodologically is that these, as you know, price series are incredibly noisy. There's and so the R squared, the fraction of the variance that's explained by the principal components in any one of these regressions is reasonably small. So you can think about this as not being a particularly dominant uh, factor. And so what, what you see here is supposed to be in color. Does that tr- appear in color? But not really. Well, there's a smooth line and there's a bumpy line. OK, so if you're still awake, do you think the smooth line is from the Kalman filter? Or there's a bumpy line from the Kalman filter? The smooth line is from the Kalman filter. All right? The thing that the Kalman filter does is it does the cross-sectional averaging, but it actually does a little bit of temporal averaging as well. And that's going to give a smoother estimate of the common factor. And just sort of looking at this, a common factor that has that smoother estimate kind of is, is sensible. Whether that translates into forecasting improvements, I think, is a question that you know, we'll just need, uh, the, the we broadly define, need a little bit more experience on. Uh, but, it, but it certainly, in this example, looks quite promising uh, to be giving um, improvements. OK, so uh, this is a good place to break. So we'll come back and talk about um, selecting the number of factors, or estimating the number of factors. The smallest, and they look like this. And then you figure out what's big and what's little. And just by looking at it, and then you decide that there's seven big factors. Okay, so that's one way to do it, and it's not useless. Uh, it has no. It until very recently had no distribution theory associated with it. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I'm not going to go into any of that. Let me talk a little bit about some methods for estimating factors. So there's uh, the main procedure that's used right now is something called the binding information criterion. And looking around this room, I think, for the benefit of being expeditious, since I'm left with mainly the hardcore econometricians, um, I'm going to, the, the next, oh, we're the one of the, <laughs> well, I, have, I have a long series of slides that's for general purpose edification, which is what's an information criterion? And I was going to relate that to Bayes and Akiyuki information criteria in terms of estimating the lag length in an ARP. And, um, and so I will give you the very brief version of that. An information criterion, it, so suppose you don't, know, you don't know P. You want to run an autoregression. And so here's the game we're playing. So the game we're playing is that you know it's an autoregression. You know it has finite order. The order is no more than a certain number, 7. And you just don't know what it is. It's less than, maybe it's seven, maybe it's six, and you want to figure that out. And if you do sequential testing, like if you do 5% significance testing, if you go from the beginning to the end, that's a bad idea because, like, you could have an autoregression where the first coefficient is zero, and, you know, you never get beyond that. And you could, uh, you go from the other direction. If you're just doing hypothesis testing, you've got a type one and type two error that's going to end up not going away. So, uh, information criteria get around that and provide a way to provide a consistent estimator of P. And the way it does it is it says, I'm going to ask you to trade off. Uh, if I look at the lag length P, I'm going to provide you with an, uh, with an objective function. And the objective function is going to do two things. I'm going to say that as you increase um, P, you're necessarily going to improve the fit. The R squared has to go up. The sum of squared residuals has to go down. So. Uh, you're necessarily going to be improving the fit, but I'm going to penalize you. And the way I'm going to penalize you is add in a penalty factor that is increasing. Actually, I wrote it, drew it as a curve, but it increases linearly in these <coughs> as you add as you add um, as you add p uh, as you add more lags. And if you then add these two together, there'll be a minimum. And that minimum is going to be your estimate of uh, is your is going to be your estimate of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the lag length. And so the whole trick is figuring out what the slope of this penalty factor should be. And uh, the theory of uh, there's the, the 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 theory basically says that if this penalty factor goes to zero, but it goes to zero slowly, then you're going to get a consistent estimator. And so the way that the proof works 
is that you look at two cases, the case that you underpredict, and you show that that can't happen. Well, why couldn't you underpredict? Well, okay, so well, to, to underpredict, what you'd have to be doing is giving yourself a really big penalty because by underpredicting, you, you're you're necessarily losing some gain from the sum of squared residuals uh, being decreased. So you've got to be using a really big penalty factor to underpredict. So if your penalty factor goes to zero, you're not going to underpredict. Uh, to overpredict, to overpredict is kind of more subtle because. You know, you'd love to overpredict just by maximizing the R squared and minimizing the sum of squared residuals. To overpredict, for that not to happen, well, you have to be using a penalty factor. It can't be too small. So the penalty factor has to be, well, it can't, it can't be too small. And, and, and if you choose it just right, then. Um, then you're not going to overpredict. And so there's a proof in an, inter in an introductory econometrics textbook for undergraduates that does that. OK, um, so the binding criterion is exactly the same thing, which is, which is I'm going to look at the log of the sum of squared residuals divided by the sample size with a penalty factor. Log of sum of squared residuals is a little more complicated because it's not just a regression. We've got this big matrix x, and we're fitting everything to the matrix. So the log sum of squared residuals is going to be, well, you could do it as a trace way, or you could do it as a sum over t and a sum over i of fitted values of, uh, of given, re given residuals. And so, but that's basically the sum of squared residuals from, uh, from doing uh, this fit. So it's not, by the way, the generalized least square sum of squared residuals. It's the regular OLS sum of squared residuals. And now you got to add a penalty factor. Well, this is a bizarre penalty factor. The BIC penalty factor was log t over t, um, which goes to 0, but it doesn't go to 0 too quickly. This is very strange. This is n plus t divided by n times t times the minimum of n and t. And you say, well, where does that come from? And it actually turns out to be quite clever. And it, what it's supposed to do is it, is, is it handles n and t getting big at lots of different rates. If, so if you, but n and t both have to get big for this thing to work. Suppose that n is fixed. Then this is going to cancel, and this is going to get big at rate t, and it's not going to have a penalty factor that goes to 0. Um, if you want to plug in a case where n equals t, then you work it out. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, wow, I have an important typo right here. This is an important typo. Ready? I'm, I, the whole purpose of this was to give you the formula for what seems to be in practice of the various information criteria that have been performed, pr pr produced, the one that seems to work the best in Monte Carlo simulations. And that's Bai and Ning's ICP2. And I typed it wrong. That's bad, OK? It's got a log in there. This is it, OK? It's right on the next page. Here's the intuition for why this actually is pretty sensible. BIC works pretty well. I, I mean, that's the recommended procedure for an autoregression if you don't want to overestimate. AIC will give you some overestimation. It, actually, AIC overestimates with finite probability uh, asymptotically. Suppose that n equals t. Then we have 2t here, and we have t squared down here. So that's going to be 2 times t over t squared, which is 2 over t. n equals t, then the minimum of n and t is t. So it's going to be 2 log t over t, 2 log t over t. That's BIC. That's the BIC criterion. OK, so this actually is pretty sensible. It, it's very much like BIC. BIC works well, and this seems to be the one that works the best in practice. Now, that said, in practice, different information criteria can yield really quite different answers. So, uh, and there's some delicacy, and you have to use judgment. So like any, any empirical work, you, you have to you know, think about what you're doing, not just, not just mindlessly apply uh, a procedure, and then when it says that there's 29 factors, you just sort of say, OK, and, and estimate 29 factors. Um, I have never seen it say 29 factors, uh, actually. I haven't seen it say 9. OK, which might be sensible or not. 
Okay. Um, and let me make a brief aside about estimating the number of dynamic factors. That was estimating the number of so-called static factors, which is the number, because this is this uh, p- principal component's objective function. The number of static factors is not equal to the number of dynamic factors. In fact, if you remember, the number of it, the way we derived the static factor form was by stacking the dynamic factors. So in principle, there's quite a few, potentially quite a few fewer dynamic factors than static factors. Maybe, maybe not, but it depends on the dynamics. So for some purposes, you might, might want to estimate the number of dynamic factors. Um, basically, so here's the basic idea of how you can go about doing this. This is the static factors. Suppose that you actually knew the static factors, the Fs. If you ran a regression of the Fs on their lags, you're going to get some residuals from that VAR. That VAR of Fs on its lags is going to have some residuals. The rank of those residuals is actually going to be the rank of the number of shocks of the dynamic factors. So the intuition here is take the principal components, run a regression on their lags, and then look at the rank of the residual matrix. There's a number of different ways that that can be implemented. Um, Amon Gwell Watson have one approach to doing it. Mai and Ning have another approach to doing it. Um, there's a paper that came out in JAZA that has a completely different... Uh, uh, it's the same fundamental idea, which is a ranked efficiency idea, but it's implemented in the frequency domain. Um, I'm just going to refer you to those. We did, in some work that we've done, we've done a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations on these, uh, and we didn't think that any of these methods particularly worked very well, um, but uh, I don't know. Mark liked Amongell Watson. All right, so... All right. Um, testing. Let me say just a couple of words about testing. So it's actually, it's, this is a, an interesting digression. Uh, interesting to some econometric theorists. Uh, this is actually an ancient and a very difficult problem. So um, w- one question that you might ask... I just gave an information criterion approach... A different approach, go back to the autoregression problem. One approach is estimate the lag order. Another approach is simply, can you test the hypothesis of three lags against the alternative of four lags, or zero lags against the alternative of one lag? That's a well-defined problem. We know how to do that using t-statistics and f-statistics and all that. Here you can ask the you could ask, what's the, can we test the null hypothesis of no factors against the alternative of one, or can we test the null hypothesis of one factor against the alternative of two? And it turns out that's actually a really difficult problem. If the data are exactly normally, if, if the data are IID normal, so if the X's are IID normal, then the X prime X matrix is going to be a wish art of degrees of freedom, of a of, of, of wish art that has the dimensionality of the number of series, n by n, and of degrees of freedom that's uh, t. So that's going to be a, uh, that's going to be a wish art. If, I'm sorry, if the x's are iid standard normal, then that will be a, a wish art matrix. There's well-developed theory in Anderson, 1984, summarizes all of that, um, multivariate analysis, on the distribution of eigenvalues of wish art matrices, and so that's well understood. The trouble with that is that the assumptions that I just made, iid standard normal, uh, is not at all of interest in the practical applications that we're, inter- that, that, that we're, that we're looking at. And, and those distributions that exist are actually very delicate to that normality assumption. There's no asymptotics until very recently. And recently, uh, it turns out that something that these theoretical physicists, some, some uh, uh, thermo- theoretical thermodynamics uh, did in 1994, Tracy and Whittem applies. And so some guys at Stanford, Johnston, and then a student, El Karui, were able to generalize the tracy Whittem distribution. What's the tracy Whittem distribution? The tracy Whittem distribution is an asymptotic distribution for the maximum eigenvalue of that Wishart. And it turns out it goes to some really bizarre limiting law called the tracing tracy Whittem law. And, and they were able to generalize that. Recently, Onatsky has tried to apply these to the problems. Alexei Onatsky at Columbia has tried to apply these to problems of dynamic factor modeling, where we now have a, a much more complicated setup 
than just this IID Gaussian thing where there's going to be a variety of potential correlations and, uh, and so forth. And he's made a couple of important steps. And one of the steps in a, in a paper in 2007, which is very cool, which he solved a classic problem, which is in, in the cross-sectional factor model, what's the distribution of the scree plot? Right? And so he's, he solved that. What's the distribution of the of a group of k largest eigenvalues of a, of of a, in, in the the classic uh, static factor model? Um, that still isn't quite good enough for the dynamic factor model applications. There's a paper of his that has a test. Um, it is I think this test is not ready for prime time, but it's an interesting line of research, and I think it's promising. Uh, it's and we'll just have to see how this uh, plays out. But it's a potential additional tool, not really ready for practitioners at this point, but it could could prove to be a useful tool in addition to these, um, in the in addition to these uh, um, information criteria of Bai and Ning. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to talk very briefly, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some of this material. Because my guess is that this group is more interested in... You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually go to the stuff... I'm going to reorganize this talk. Because I I didn't sort of think about this in terms of people trying to catch a plane. I went through all of this stuff at the beginning about empirical bays. And that was actually going somewhere, and this is where it's going. So I, I, I said at the very beginning that dynamic factor models um, are just one of a possible w- set of ways you could approach this, that there's a whole family of different procedures, and that the whole reason of going through that empirical base was there's very sound theoretical reasons to think about alternative procedures, not just DFMs. So before one just says DFMs are great and you go on your way, it really is incumbent upon everybody to look carefully at all of these alternatives that are theoretically suggested. And so this whole set of slides has to do with forecast based on Bayes and empirical Bayes methods. And um, I will come back to that because I think this is quite important. And it, in the bottom lines, it ends up making dynamic factor models looking uh, very, uh, very promising. Um, so, but I'm going to come back to that empirical evidence on dynamic factor models and their forecasting performance and their fit, uh, which is a, substan- a substantial amount of work. But I'm going to do that at the end because <clears throat> I have a feeling that <clears throat> there's probably a fair amount of interest in talking about applications of DFMs, first of all, as uh, in the context of uh, stru- structural vector autoregressions, second, in the context of IVs, and third, in the context of DSGE estimation. So I'm going to talk about those three topics, and then I'm going to return at the end to topic five. This is not exactly the logical order. A logical order here is before just jumping on board the DFM bandwagon here, we really should test it against a lot of other things. It turns out it does really well. Okay, So we'll come back and we'll give that evidence. Okay, Favar. So, so far what I've been talking about is using DFMs uh, solely in the context of forecasting. We've been interested in the space span by the Fs, uh, and if we had the space span by the Fs, we can use that for forecasts. Um, and and, and, and I, I mean, that's a, a very interesting application. If you think about it, we can have internally consistent forecasts for a large range of different series. We can do it on a daily basis or a weekly basis. You can have a completely consistent updating system when revi- data revisions come out. And it, it sort of incorporates all of this stuff in a completely coherent way. So that's very appealing. Um, and it's, I think that's a really big triumph of extensions of time series technology. Um, in, in without imposing any structure at all. Um, it is that said, uh, many of the questions that one is interested in are structural questions, such as the SVAR impulse response question about the impulse response with respect to a monetary shock. OK. 
Okay. So you remember all of those critiques from yesterday about SVARs, and FAVARs are attempt, an attempt to get at some of those critiques. <clears throat> so, um, you know, how Rudabush and others pointed out that the Fed uses more information than is in a standard VAR. Uh, and that's just true. It's completely true. Uh, there's this question about the invertibility problem, um, whether or not the space uh, of the uh, structural shocks are spanned by the space of the innovations. And then, um, and then there's the question, even if only you want to use a VAR for uh, forecasting, you might want to be able to use an extension of a VAR with lots of uh, variables, but not necessarily in the dynamic factor structure. And so in an attempt to address these different concerns, uh, has, has been to uh, try to take some of the um, technology from dynamic factor models and pull it over into the SVAR literature. And so that's, uh, there's a bunch of papers that have done that. Uh, they all differ, uh, and there's other ones I'm sure that I haven't listed. They all seem to differ in the details of the implementation. I don't think there's any, any when you sit down to the level of the specific steps in the algorithm or the computer program, everything is a little bit different. I don't think this is a convergence on a single method. What I'm going to describe here is something that's very similar to the original, the, the key paper in this literature, which is Bernanke, uh, uh, Bovon, and Giannone, uh, and, um, or, and, excuse me, and Elia, uh, Bernanke, Bovon, and Elias, B, B, and E. Uh, and um, and uh, not every detail is the same in the way I'm describing it as in BBE, but this is the general idea. All right? So, okay, so here's what we want to do is we want to identify a structural shock, and we want to use this uh, to um, produce impulse responses for a large range of variables. So we've got to deal with the identification problem. So we somehow need to formulate this in a way that we can attack the identification problem. You, you can't just like throw in the Fs as regressors. The Fs are not identified. Right? The Fs that we've been using so far are unidentified. They're just there's an arbitrary normalization in, in the way they've been constructed by principal components. It's not a Kleski factorization. They're orthonormal by construction, but it's because of this eigenvalue thing. I mean, it's totally arbitrary. Right? It's a totally arbitrary uh, normalization. We've got the space spanned by the Fs, but we sure don't have any structural shocks. So we're going to want to, if we want to think about those Fs in a meaningful way, we're going to have to somehow do some identification. The SVA, the FAVAR approach, um, let me just step through this. Right? Let me step through it. All right, so here's, uh, and I'm looking at a DFM with first order dynamics. And so I, it, it's, it's easier without lag polynomials. All right, so first order dynamics, so the, the static factors obey a first order f vector autoregression. These are the, these are the structure, these are the shocks. Uh, let me use the better word. These are the innovations in the dynamic factor model. The dynamic factor model innovations, there's only R of the, there's only Q of those, but there are R static factors. So G is a R by Q matrix, which takes the reduced number of dynamic factor innovations and turns them into innovations to the static factors. The static factors then enter into the X equation. And I'm going to assume first order dynamics for an, an AR1 for each of the E's. So it could be higher order. The, the fact that these are AR1s and VAR1s makes no difference at all, but it just makes the, it, the exposition simpler. OK, so what I'm going to do, the first step, is I'm going to turn this system here, which is a state-based representation, into a VAR, something x here. Here's the x depends on current f. I want to get rid of that, and I want to just have it depend on shocks and lag stuff. All right, so I'm just going to do some, a little bit of algebra. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to first quasi-difference the x's, and then I'm going to substitute this, uh, the f uh, equation in, and then I'm going to rearrange everything. And then I'm going to stack it with the F equation, and here it is. So it says that the Fs 
depend on lag f's with this f. This, is, this first equation is just the state equation for the f's. The second equation is that x depends on lag f's and lag x's and then some innovation type things. So this is the innovation this is the, uh, the innovation, the disturbance type things. This is the innovation in the factor equation, and this is the, an error term or a measurement error, if you will, in the, uh, in the x equation. All right. Um, so, so, okay, so now how does this relate to usual VARs? Um, the uh, residual for, or the innovation in a conventional VAR, which is the projection of, uh, of, uh, of x on itself, well, Throughout all of this, like I did at the beginning, I'm going to assume that the factors are observed. You know, why am I assuming the factors are observed? Because we can actually estimate them consistently. So for the sake of this argument, let's just imagine the factors are observed. So the projection of x on itself is equivalent to the projection of uh, all of x on the factors and itself. And so um, if that's just going to be these, these bits here. It's going to be lambda times uh, g eta t plus, uh, plus uh, zeta t where the zetas are the disturbances to the idiosyncratic uh, process. OK, so with that set up, we're now ready to ask this identification question. And the identification question is, what's the relationship between the innovations in the dynamic factor model and the underlying structural disturbances to the dynamic factor model? This is the exact same notation. This is now an eta instead of a u, but this is the same business as yesterday when we were talking about SVARs. What's r? Right, so that's the identification question. And at this point, you can go start talking about identification in a variety of different ways. Um, but the way that, um, so, so I'm sorry, let me postpone that just for a second. If I, once I know that rotation, matrix R, I could then compute the impulse responses. So I substitute everything in, and I just, uh, and I, and I just uh, write things out in moving average representations. And this is going to be the impulse response uh, lag polynomial, or this is just going to be the impulse response matrix uh, that, that's what I want, which is going to be the res- effect on the x's of uh, an impulse response to the epsilons. OK. So, um, Lags. I just wrote out in the formula in case there's lags there. And so the main issue is what do we do um, in terms of identification? And at this point, actually, I think the easiest thing of all to see is this idea of heralds, which is I've got this system now. And I can actually, I, I could say that these are, this, is, this has a covariance matrix as the identity matrix. I can identify the space spanned by the etas. So I can come up with R that's going to be a Kolesky factorization of the covariance matrix of the etas. And I can just go through and I can say, I only want those R's that satisfy certain sign restrictions. Okay, so the, e- the easiest way to think about identification here without having to do any complicated projections or anything is just to say, I'm going to go sample R after R after R that's going to be a rotation of a Kolesky factorization, and I'm going to keep the ones that have impulse responses that look good. That's probably not a fair way to say it, but that satisfy a priori theoretical restrictions. <laughs> But actually, you can, you can work through the algebra, and you can do heteroscedasticity here, too, if you wanted to. Now, what BBE do, I actually haven't worked through the algebra on long-run restrictions. I bet you could do that, but I, I haven't done that algebra. What BB and E do is they do a timing scheme, a slow, path, a slow fast timing scheme, just like we set out in, in, just like set out in the handbook chapter by Christiana Weichenbaum and Evans. Let me talk about that just briefly, OK? So here's the, here's the idea. Not, not the, th- this is not actually how they implement it. This is how I understand how I would implement it, which is you categorize the variables into th- three groups, into slow variables, a policy variable, and fast variables. And, um, and then the factors 
are completely unidentified, but what you po- would posit is that one of the factors, you posit that one of the factors uh, is actually a monetary policy factor. That monetary policy factor isn't necessarily observed. There's some measurement error on it. So what you'd like to know is you'd like to know the A to T of the monetary policy uh, factor. With this fast, slow identification scheme, some of the factors are going to be loading contemporaneously on uh, some of the factors. I'm sorry. The, the restriction is that the monetary policy factor does not load on the slow-moving variables. So here's the idea. You take the VAR residuals for the slow, the implied residuals from the structure for the slow-moving variables. You do a reduced rank regression of those onto the space spanned by the etas. You then take, uh, you then, now you've got the space spanned by the etas and uh, space spanned by the etas and also the space spanned by the slow-moving variables. You can then use the exclusion restriction that interest rates do not, the interest rate shock does not enter the space span by the slow moving variable etas to identify the interest rate shock in a completely parallel fashion as to how you would do it in a regular timing VAR, and therefore you have the eta TR. And so you got eta TR and then you zap it through. So that's in words. That's not how, exactly how they do it, but that's, that's described in uh, more detail in a Stock Watson 2005 paper. Okay. And the thing is, like you get oodles and oodles of impulse responses out. And also what's kind of interesting, and I think this is a good question, and the whole, what part of the point is that you're using a lot more information, so you should get more efficiency. And maybe that means that the fact that they have tight conference bands here is actually correct. Uh, I mean, it, 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 you, it's really it's plausible that you're going to get more efficient estimation of all of these things by using a much bigger system. And you could just go on for pages and pages in terms of impulse responses uh, because you've got so many variables in the system that you can actually tell a story about what's happening to every, every variable that you could, uh, you could want. Okay, one other important point that's, I think, quite nice about this structure is that we're used to thinking about uh, structural vector autoregressions that are exactly identified. This is way over-identified. There are a ton of exclusion restrictions because there's a ton of slow-moving variables. And we're saying that those interest rate shocks don't enter any of those slow-moving variables. So you can go through and you can see, well, do you, does that look credible or not? I mean, you can estimate. You could put those in the regressions. You could see what the coefficients are. You can do J-tests. But you can also just see, is this a big deal or not? Do we believe these exclusion restrictions? So that's kind of a nice feature that you could do SVARs that aren't exactly identified. So, so there's a lot of nice things about this, actually. Very intriguing. OK. Factors as instruments. I, I guess let me just make one quick other comment about favars, which is, as this list indicates, I think there's a lot. I haven't seen a single. I haven't seen any paper that's done any of the, these three items. So I think there's a lot of interesting things to pursue here. Oh, there is one with sign restrictions. Oh, what's t- who, who's? Oh, okay. Is this an uncirculated paper? I, so, so it's so it's all right that I didn't know about it. Okay. Okay. There will be a paper on sign restrictions in Favars. Good. I'm a good forecaster. OK. Factors as instruments. OK. Uh, in some sense, this is all going to be just an application of theory that's already been presented. Remember in the Stock Watson 2002 and then refined in the Binding 2006 paper, theorems were proven that indicated that you could use the factors as regressors in forecasting equations without having to worry about a generated regressor problem. Basically, you're estimating them well enough that you could just throw them in as data. And uh, well, a forecasting equation is, sounds a lot like a first stage regression. 
And so if you can do it in a forecasting equation, you ought to be able to do it in a first stage regression. And so that's, that's what this literature is about. This is not uh, actually all that new an idea. So I understand, like, I understand that this was done like 30 or 40 years ago by the simultaneous equation folks who would have lots of instruments and they didn't know quite how to use them all. So they would compute a principal component and they would just use that as an instrument. So there's no theory or anything like that, but it's, not, it's actually not new to, to knowledge. The, certainly the proof about how this actually works um, is, is new to knowledge, but, it's, um, but it's, it's not exactly a new idea. Um, one of the interesting... Uh, one, I mean, so the whole point of this, I mean, going back to weak instruments, the whole point of this is, you know, we're not so, in, in some applications, some applications, instruments are strong and GMM works great and we're happy, but in some, instrument, some applications, we just don't have strong instruments. And in those circumstances, you can, there's some technology that's available for improving the quality of inference with weak instruments, but it sure is a nice idea to try to get better instruments. And so that's what this is about. Maybe this will produce better instruments, uh, stronger instruments. Um, the uh, um, the uh, main uh, theorem, uh, which is in two, both of these papers, there's, there's two independently written papers that were written apparently within a week of each other uh, by Capitanos and Marcelino and Bai and Ning. And the main theorem that they both prove is that um, you get first order asymptotically equivalent results under the usual conditions with many uh, regress, many instruments uh, that these are going to be, uh, it's, it doesn't matter whether you use the true factors or the estimated factors. And you know, before we were talking about the many weak instruments problem, and we were talking about many, many instruments, like k is 10 to infinity and k over t to the fourth tends to zero. We're talking about tons and tons and tons of instruments here. But the reason this isn't a many weak instruments problem and that technology and that constraint doesn't bind is that, of course, the linear combination that you're using isn't being estimated in a first stage regression. The linear combination is being estimated through principal components and it's, it's the, all of the action is coming through the, the dynamic factor structure. Uh, and then once you've got a small number of instruments, two or three or four, then, it, then, then it's just standard. Uh, it's no longer many instrument problem. Um, OK, a uh, couple of interesting notes on this. Um, this is, I, this, so, so this is, I think, I can't think of an application off the top of my head for which this is a useful comment, but it's an interesting comment. So the interesting comment is that under this dynamic factor structure, any individual x might not be a valid instrument, but the principal component formed by the x's might be a, common, a valid instrument. So how can that be? And the reason is that the idiosyncratic terms are correlated with the error in the ver- equation of interest. You essentially average out the idiosyncratic terms, and you're only left with the factors. So if the factors are valid instruments, and the idiosyncratic ter- and the individual ones or individual x's are not because of the idiosync- idiosyncratic terms, you can get rid of that endogeneity using principal components or by this factor method. So that's an interesting point that helps you understand what's going on. I can't think of any application in which that's a useful observation, but maybe there is one. Um, this doesn't so- this, this, the hope here, of course, is that this would solve the weak instrument problem, or at least it would solve it in the sense that you wouldn't have to worry about it. That may or may not be true. That might be a false hope. Uh, if it's a false hope, then you know if these are we- if these factors are weak instruments, then you're still back in the first uh, of the first of my talks. DSGEs and factor models. Any any questions on that? Okay. Well, you know, when we talked about factor models yesterday, the steps were solve it for the Euler equations, log linearize, solve for the expectations, put it in state space form. And that state space form for uh, 
the so so that, that's for example that's what Sargent did. He didn't have to log linearize it as a quadratic. I believe his original model, if I recall correctly. That state space form can be thought of as as this. Well, well, this is actually a reduced form. Remember how I said these f's? You could like put in a hh inverse in here. So this you can think about this as a reduced form. I haven't imposed any structure at all on this. There's some crazy normalization, like you know the principal components normalization or something like that. Well, if you impose some structure on this and you make this a structural model and maybe you impose some, enough normalization to identify it, let me, call, let me put tildes on top of everything. So and I'm going to call this a structural model. Well, what does a structural model mean? A structural model means that now the, these phi's, if I want to think about this as a structural model or more particularly, more precisely, a state space, the state space equation, the, states, the state equation for uh, a DSGE, these phi's are going to be functions of some underlying DSGE parameters, say theta. Uh, so are the covariance matrices here. These x's are going to be the things that you're going to use to estimate the DSGE. I've thrown on some measurement error. Sargent had some measurement error in his paper. He said that the statistical agencies added on measurement error. So you could do that. Or you could say, I, I don't like that idea, and, and you could zero out this term. Aside from notation, this is the model that I wrote down yesterday, right? Okay. Here's what Bovan and Giannone did, which is really cool. Okay, what Bovan and Giannone said is everybody who's estimated DSGE so far has uh, taken them far too literally. There's this thing that they call X in a DSGE. There's one X in the economy. And that one X is, I don't know, different people, somebody, somebody might think it's labor share, or somebody else might think it's output gap, or somebody else might think it's consumption growth. But there's one X in the economy. And there's one R, and there's one pi. And that's stupid. So here's what they say. They say there's a latent factor, X, I don't know. I have income and consumption. I probably shouldn't have done that. I should have, for, to keep this consistent with the, the lecture yesterday, I should have had X and pi and, and okay? So this, let's call this X. There's one thing. It's called X. It's X. It's X in those equations. Well, what's X? X is related to maybe some income growth series or some output gaps or some consumption series or something like that. There's no one X that's the right X. There's a number of things that are very closely related to it, but they're just measurements that are related to it. But then there's got to be some measurement error too because they're not the same thing. And there's one pi in the DSGE, but we know that there's a ton of different pies in the real world. And they're all kind of related to that pi. We don't observe the DSGE pi. It's a well-defined thing. The well, it's well-defined. It's just that it's latent. And you, you know, there's one R in the DSGE, and that's related to a whole bunch of things in, in the real world. So there's these latent variables that have multiple indicators or multiple variables that are related to them, and they're related to them in a very precise way. The way you get identification is by imposing zero restrictions in the, in the factor loading matrix. This X only loads on certain variables, and this R or pi only loads on certain variables. This is actually, if you think about it, how many identifying restrictions do you need? It's going to go back to the same uh, R or Q times Q minus 1 over 2. And this has got, you know, millions of zeros in it. So this is heavily over-identified. That's a good thing, right? So you can check it out. So that's, that's what they do. So they say we've got, uh, the way I would, so I don't know if this is good terminology or not. I call these variables that are related to, I've called, 
these variables that are related to the unobserved factors as measurements of them, things that are like sensors. So why do I say that? It's like you've got some latent, you know, you're measuring a wing in an airplane, and you've got a whole bunch of sensors on it that are going to give different readings of what's going on in the wing of the airplane. And then you've got, those. this one has to do with the wing of the airplane, and this one has to do with the engine, and I don't know. Okay? So there are sensors. And then we've got other things that are just plain old information series. Well, what is an information series? An information series is something that might respond to, might actually be based on expected future values of the Fs. Well, we can think of objects that are going to be based on expected future values of the Fs, like the stock stock returns. So if the stock market moves, it's, in ex- it's re- responding to expectations, at least one imagines, that's responding to expectations of things that might be happening in the future. If the only things in the world that could happen are Fs, that means it's responding to expectations of future Fs. If it's a future F that is responding to the projection of the future F on today's F is going to not involve a single F but all of these things because it's a VAR, so the projection of FT onto FT minus 1 is going to be phi FT minus 1. So we're going to, in general, have all of the Fs loading onto the stock market. So we have some sensor variables, and we have some information variables. And they are identified by zeros in the sensor variable factor loading equation. And phi, the state transition equation is a function of the deep parameters of the DSGE. And I think this is just such a a wonderful idea. I think this is such a great paper. They estimate it by, uh, you know, these Bayesian methods. You don't have to. I mean, I'd actually really, really be interested in seeing this estimated just by ML because, you know, you're using now a great deal of information to try to identify this. And if there's deep problems in terms of model identification here, then, you know, it's, gonna, it's hard to see how you're going you're gonna to be able to make substantial empirical improvements. So, in any event, they have three different cases. So case A is like the vanilla case where you might, it's a medium-sized model. It's not a small model. Uh, so it's like they have seven equations, and they just make some, you know, the standard pi is like GDP deflator or something like that. Uh, and then they ex- move on to 14 variables, and then they move on to 91 variables, a lot of which are these information variables. The information variables aren't going to help with the identification of the Fs, but you know what they're going to do is they're going to help with the parameter estimation, and they're going to help really being able to figure out what these shocks are. And so what we have here is we have uh, some point estimates for a number of different, uh, a number of different cases and then, um, and then posterior ranges of posterior distributions. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, that's just, just what it is. Um, I guess one of the, you know, it's these particular results are somewhat disappointing in that one would have hoped to have seen standard errors reduced substantially, but I don't think that the fact that the, that the standard errors haven't come down so substantially uh, here, um, these are, first of all, they're not standard errors, they're posterior spreads. Um, and second of all, I mean, this is just the first paper trying to implement this methodology, and I think there's you know, a, lot of, a lot of promise, uh, a lot of promise. I mean, if the standard errors, if the posterior spreads aren't coming down at all, it's got to be some indication that these models are essentially um, unidentified in some sense. Okay. Um, so let me now go back to, uh, go back to this um, empirical, uh, excuse me, some of the, so this, the two sections that I skipped, which is section four and section five. Okay, so so far everything we've been talking about uh, in terms of concrete empirical stuff has been dynamic factor models, and um, as I emphasized, I think it's 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 a question as to whether or not the dynamic factor models are actually an empirical question ultimately as to whether dynamic factor models are the best window 
or the best model or the best framework to use uh, to tackle some of the questions that we've been uh, talking about. So um, what that means, it's incumbent to compare dynamic factor models to other things. Uh, so there's a number of ways to ask this. You, you can ask the question, f- so the you can ask, in terms of empirical assessment, you can talk about forecasting, you can talk about in-sample measures of fit, or you can talk about other diagnostics. Right now, I'm just going to focus on alternative forecasting methods, and then we'll come back more generally to uh, measures of fit. Okay. So the forecasting problem that we're going to talk about is the one where we have um, a large number of uh, predictors, and we're going to look at uh, the uh, projection of y on these uh, orthonormal predictors. These orthonormal predictors that we're going to focus on are going to be the principal components in the empirical application. And this is the problem that we studied in terms of the Bayes and empirical Bayes estimation uh, problem. So um, the frequentist problem, if you recall, was to find the estimator that minimizes the um, frequentist risk. Through that series of calculations, the frequentist risk is equal to the Bayes risk with the um, with uh, with um, some g sub n with the actual empirical CDF of the d's, um, the empirical base estimator. Uh, one way to think about the empirical base estimator is that you try g after g after g, prior after prior after prior, and then eventually you find one that does a good job forecasting. That's actually not how it's implemented, of course, but that's the the general idea, um, and so. Uh, the theorem is that you do that again and again and again, and eventually the G that you settle on is going to be G sub n, and by empirical Bayes you will have solved the frequentist problem. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, we're going to look at empirical Bayes estimators, and I'm also going to introduce as a general, general matter uh, a number of other um, estimators that have been developed in the, um, in the statistical literature. And again, so, so I think the reason I went through all of this, you know, if you, if you saw the macro seminar and it said the title was Bayesian Model Averaging, Bagging, Lasso, and Hard Thresholding Forecasts of Macroeconomic Activity, most of you would skip the seminar. Okay. The reason that this is important is that these are attempts, different frameworks that are actually at a fairly deep level closely related, that are attempts to implement what can be thought of as empirical Bayes estimates that would provide an alternative to dynamic factor models. So let's think about let's think about this problem. I have all of the principal components here. 135. So some data sets have 135. The DFM literature has you do the following algorithm. Run by Ning ICP2, without the typo, choose R, according to Binding, run the regression of Y on just those principal components, and then if there's some own lags that you need, you can put those in. I've ignored that in this problem. That says that the DFM literature says we're going to impose the restriction that delta 5 through delta 135 equals 0. That might be a good restriction. I mean, you know, Sarge Georgi thought it was a good restriction, and Sargent and likes that restriction, but it might not be a good restriction, and it's an empirical question. And if it's not a good restriction, and if we're supposed to use all of the data, that actually is going to tell us a great deal. So if it turns out the DFMs don't forecast as well as these other methods that would use all of this information, that actually tells us something about the limitations of DFMs as a way to think about the world. So it's a relevant question to compare DFM forecasts to all of these other forecasts that would be using the remaining 131 principal components. The optimal Bayes thing to do, if you're a plain old-fashioned subjectivist Bayesian, 
is simply to use your own personal prior G, and that's a nice framework for thinking about it. It's definitely going to be admissible. That's the, that's the, the, the decision theoretic result, that, uh, the complete class theorem. Um, if you are a lucky Bayesian and you happen to use the right uh, prior, you happen to have the right prior, you'll also be the one that solves the frequentist risk problem. Uh, hard thresholding is a great buzzword for something that you already know. Hard thresholding is you compute the t-statistic on a testing delta equals zero and you compare it to a number. Okay, so now you have another way to... A- AIC and BIC in this context reduce to hard thresholding. Um, let me tell you what false discovery rate methods are very, very briefly. So this goes back to the 10 million probes on a chip. and um, so I'm just going to st- state the problem. The, the problem for false discovery rates is it's related to what's called the multiple uh, testing problem or the multiple comparison problem. If you, um, so when you're doing this genomic DNA stuff and you have these, this is 10 million, but I understand that it's actually supposed to be 30 million um, probes on a chip. Um, what you'd like to do is uh, apparently these probes measure some sort of intensities and you want to find the values that are big uh, and n- not the values that are small. And these values that are big apparently have to do with potential, well actually I know what they exactly have to do with, which is when you measure the, the numbers of, the, the, the numbers on the probe are related to um, uh, uh, Genes make make they normally come in pairs, and if there's a problem, uh, if there's a cancerous problem, there might be a single one, or there might be more than one pair. They might make multiple ones, and so when you shine a light through them on this probe, there's different levels of densities and intensi- light intensities. So you can actually pick up uh, whether you have one copy or two copies or three copies. So what you're trying to estimate is the copy number of gene on each probe, and if it's tumorous. Uh, or def- if, if, it's, if, if it's defective, then you will, uh, instead of just coming in pairs, you're going to have multiple uh, copies. And so what you want to do is you want to identify those sites that have multiple copies and then see if you can relate that to the cancer that you're studying. The, um, if you do it as a multiple hypothesis testing problem, suppose that you look at these intensities and you construct some sort of t-statistic, if you will, uh, at each site, and you compare each site to 1.96, and there's really no tumors, then you are going to have, out of those 30 million sites, you're going to have an awful large number of uh, faults, negatives. It's, that's, not, that's not a helpful way to proceed. So instead, what they try to do is, instead of controlling the, uh, uh, instead of controlling the faults negative rate, you can control the faults positive rate, which is the faults discovery rate, and so there's, there's particular methods that are done using that. The simplest of these two methods is to imagine that you have two, um, you have two, uh, you have, you have either the right number of gene copies or you have like four, three gene copies. And then you're going to try to distinguish between those two and it's going to be some mixture distribution. And not surprisingly, that mixture distribution, the decision about whether you would decide this is going to be a bad one, that is with three gene copies, is a Bayes rule type calculation. And how do you calibrate that? You calibrate it by empirical Bayes. So it turns out that this false discovery rate is an empirical Bayes procedure, and the mathematics of that has gone through in an article that I haven't cited. Oh, there's a paper, there's some sites in an annals paper by Efren in 1983 that I, that's supposed to be right here. Um, okay, so that's another procedure that you could use. It's actually not at all relevant to us, so I'm not going to present re- any results for that, but it, it doesn't make sense in our context because our problem is just not that problem. Okay? Um, there's another thing called bootstrap aggregation, which has to do with, I'm not going to describe it. There's a paper by Inouye and Kinnelian in the uh, JBES this year that describes that. Um, and there's a really nice theoretical treatment of, of it by Buhlman and, and you in the annals. Um, and that is not a, an empirical Bayes method, but it, it could, it, and as I'll show you, it can turn into an empirical Bayes method by a suitable calibration of a tuning parameter. Here's BMA, Bayesian model averaging. So this is an explicit Bayesian procedure. Um, and um, so, so uh, Bayesian model averaging was actually invented by uh, Ed Lemer, I guess. That's, that's, 
the credit that I usually see. And the other reference that's often given is Bates and Granger, because it turns out it's very closely related to model combination or forecast combination. Um, this is there was sort of a Bayesian model averaging. Uh, is here's the it was basically a backwater for many years uh, where nothing happened, and then these guys invented these MCMC methods, and they could suddenly solve really hard problems. So it's been an area that's received a great deal of attention in the last decade or so. And there's a few applications to it in economics. I'm not really convinced that these are very interesting, the Fernandez Lay and Steele applications, but um, but the technology is. Uh, the technology is good. The Coupon Potter application is a forecasting application um, along the lines of what we're talking about uh, now. Um, so the basic idea is that there's a lot of, you're trying to do a regression, and uh, this, so here's the setup. You're trying to re- do a regression, and you've got 135 regressors, and you conjecture that maybe there's a true model, and the true model has regressor 2, 17, and 100. But you don't know what it is. Okay, so how are you going to come up with a procedure that's going to take into the possibility that there's a number of different models that you could be using, uh, and some of these models are going to be better than others? Well, better than others means that they probably will have some higher posterior probability. So what a Bayesian model averaging procedure does is in principle, it estimates all possible models, which is 135 choose 1 plus 135 choose 2 plus 135 choose 3, and so forth. So it's quite a few models. So in principle, it estimates all possible models. And then for each one, it evaluates a posterior, a posterior likelihood that it's true. Uh, and then you take the forecast from each one, and you weight those forecasts by the posterior probability. and or, and then that's going to give you your forecast. So that's the basic idea. Um, you, can see why, you can see why when it's 135 choose 1 plus 135 choose 2 plus 135 choose 3, why it was a backwater for many years. And then when these computational guys got into it, they, they thought this was really fun. All right? So, so the computation about this is how do you sample models? Because you can't possibly go to every model, but can you come up with clever ways to sample all these different models? Um, and they have something called MCMC cubed or MC cubed or something like that. Okay. Um, so here's the BMA idea, which is that you would uh, take the um, this the thing this thing called the predictive density is the density of y given the past data. So in this jargon, it's y t plus one given everything that you know up to today, and you're going to um, you're going to average that over all the different models. So you look at the predictive density for model K, and then you say, what's my posterior probability that model K is correct, given that, um, what's the posterior probability that I assign to model K, given uh, the past data? And so then you, the next step is you've got to figure out what this posterior probability of model K, given the past data is, and that's just going to be, um, that's going to be figured out by Bayes', uh, by Bayes rule. And... Uh, given a prior probability of the model. So given that the model is true, you then need to figure out what the probability of the data is given the model is true. And for that, we're going to have to do another Bayesian step. So the basic idea is for a given model, we have a prior on the parameters, and then you have probabilities over models. And so that's the, that's the setup. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, 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 it's something that is computationally quite tedious uh, and, and interesting to those who find that interesting. I guess that's a tautology. Uh, the, um, uh, it turns out that in the orthogonal regression problem, it it's completely simplifies. Because uh, whether, see, if all the regressors are correlated, then whether variables 1, 2, and 3 are in the model, that actually make, it makes a difference whether you would add 4, that's going to change the correlation structure. But if everybody's uncorrelated, then all of that breaks up, so you can just look at one variable at a time. So it turns out that you just get this huge simplification if you have orthogonal regressors. And those formulas are given in some papers in the statistics literature, which are s- cited uh, in the literature uh, survey. And then each variable, then the model is quite simple. Each variable is either in the model or out of the model with a coin flip. And then if it's in the model, you have a a posterior probability, excuse me, you have a prior probability on the coefficients. 
So it's a, it's a, and then what happens is that you get an explicit expression for this weighted average, and you get an explicit fr- expression for the forecast. Now, one reason that if you read these surveys uh, in um, BMA, they like, you know, the survey always has to start with some history thing, and they often go back to Bates and Granger. Because Bates and Granger, this is Bates and Granger, if you think about it. It says, I've got a forecast. I've, you know, I've, I'm, Mark talked about this, where I'm doing forecast pooling. And I've got a forecast from my guy at Citibank, and I've got a forecast from, you know, the person at Bear Stearns. I was at a conference, I was at a conference um, last in, in June. Where the guy was a the the guy was chief economist for Bear Stearns, which I thought was terrific. It was actually he has there was a name tag which was printed up before Bear Stearns croaked. Um, so uh, anyway, you you get these guys' forecasts and then you average them together and you average them together based on how good you think they are and how good you think they are using the optimal. Well, using the Bates Granger weights is going to be based on their sum of squared forecasting performance. And if you work through all of the BMA algebra uh, in the case of orthogonal regressors, that's exactly the explicit expression that you get, which is that you get it's not, it's not the Bates Granger expression, but it's very close to the Bates Granger expression where you penalize people who have bad sum of squared forecast errors and give more weight to people who have good forecast errors. So it's very closely related to that. Um, it actually goes back as sort of it's yet another way to think about this optimal forecast. You know, this forecast, the straight mean pooling is a puzzle, uh, but, but it, it kind of makes you think that if historically the forecasters haven't been very different, that you might want to give them weights. In the, in the end, they might end up with weights that are pretty similar. Okay. Um, so... Uh, this Bayesian model averaging depends on parameters of priors, but you will not be surprised for me uh, to hear me say that those parameters then could be estimated. So those hyperparameters can be estimated, and this Bayes procedure can be turned into empirical Bayes. Um, I just mentioned as a digression that all of these um, procedures have shrinkage representations. Remember, we started talking about the failure of OLS as being a consequence of... Uh, uh, going at in first principles, the failure of OLS being the inadmissibility of OLS and the fact that one could construct a shrinkage estimator, a James Stein estimator, that dominated OLS. And, um, and all of these uh, that I've just talked about have interpretations as shrinkage estimators. To be precise, we can write the forecast of Y as the product of the ith predictor times uh, the OLS coefficient times a function that's a function solely of the t statistic. And this function is a function that goes between 0 and 1, at least in all of the cases we've looked at, in all of the cases I listed, they go between 0 and 1. And so what that means is you're basically shrinking this coefficient to 0. So they're all shrinkage estimators where you're shrinking the coefficient to 0, but that, 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 makes, that, makes, um, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so... so uh, and it also makes sense from a B- from Bayesian perspective. Remember, you've got these Ds that are small, so you're going to be doing some Bayesian shrinkage. All right. <clears throat> um, I just give some formulas for what these shrinkage things are. All right. So in the finally on the list, there is one large dimensional method which um, I'm uh, which doesn't se- doesn't fit in this, and that's because it's a multiple equation method. Uh, using large VARs. And so there's one paper that looks at using really large VARs with strong priors. And my understanding is that this is, uh, that the hyper, I mean, my reading of the paper, the results were presented for a variety of hyperparameters uh, for the priors, and the hyperparameters that seemed to work the best were the ones that were used. And that sounds to me like one interpretation of empirical uh, Bayes. Is that is that a fair assessment? I don't think you used the term empirical Bayes in there, but that's essentially what you did. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so how do these perform? So this is really the test, and there's, at this point, there's an enormous literature with empirical evidence on dynamic factor models, and I'm not going to pretend to give a comprehensive survey 
of every paper in that literature. And so what I'm going to say is uh, a distillation of a lot of different results. There have been papers that have, as a first cut, looked at how well the dynamic factor models describe the data in terms of you know, R squareds and stuff like that. A second cut is testing some of the over-identifying restrictions implied by um, a dynamic factor model. I think, if I, I think if I remember one calculation, uh, if you have 135 variables um, and you think about a VAR with 135 variables, there are something like 240,000 over-identifying restrictions implied by a DFM. So that gives you a fair number of things you could take a look at. Um, the... Uh, uh, there's also, most of the literature is focused on forecasting performance and assessment through that, and I think that that's a natural thing to do, and it's important. There's a survey uh, by uh, Eichmeier and Ziegler, which is now a couple years old, but it has a pretty good bibliography in it. There's a meta-analysis in it, too. Um, I do not think this is a very useful meta-analysis, um, so I'm just going to make one small digression on the Eichmeier-Ziegler meta-analysis. Um, they use as the unit of observation a relative mean squared error, uh, which from tables of results in these papers, relative mean squared error is the performance of a particular forecasting method, a principal components method, for example, divided by some benchmark. The problem is that different papers use different benchmarks, and the um, the uh, the meta analysis takes those as data and then tries to understand uh, understand the, the variation in these relative mean squared errors as a function of a variety of different features. But since the denominator in these relative mean squared errors isn't the same from paper to paper, I think that that's a really um, problematic, uh, a problematic exercise. It's a valiant thing to do, but, I'm not, but, I, but I have some questions about that particular. I think it's a very hard, very hard. I'm not sure that, I think meta-analyses are valiant efforts. Uh, they're fairly controversial. Uh, for the sorts of reasons uh, that it's difficult to combine studies uh, in a formal way. Um, okay, so let me make a couple of comments. I'm going to go through a list of things. First of all, with data selection, um, uh, as a practical matter, there are a couple of th- most. There isn't a lot of talk about data selection in the papers, but of course, in practice, that's an important thing to do. I think that. When you're actually formulating and estimating a DFM, you have to bear in mind that the factors that you get out are going to depend upon the variables that you put in. If you put in entirely output series, you're going to get out output factors. If you put in entirely price series, you're going to get out price factors. So it depends what your application is, but you have to, if you want to have a broad swath of economic variable uh, factors, rec- ref- if you want your factors to reflect a lot of different economic features, you have to have. Uh, a large number of uh, uh, varied different things. I think one of the issues, one of the, one of the critiques of these papers that find a very small number of dynamic factors is that potentially or arguably the data that they're using are heavily dominated by just real activity variables. Um, so I've talked about comparison among the different factor estimation methods. I don't think that there's a great deal of evidence um, suggesting that one is better than the other. If I had to recommend one right now uh, in terms of a combination of convenience and efficiency, I guess it would probably be um, principal components followed by uh, the two-step ML. So that still requires you to write down the the, uh, state space representation and pass it through the filter. Um, But that does give you a lot of flexibility in terms of doing things in real time and working with messy data. There's been... Um, a, a number of papers that have been com- compare, that have compared many, foreca- many predictor forecasting methods. I've listed a few of them here, and there are some other ones. I, um, my overall impression from those uh, is that, by and large, uh, these dynamic factor models come out looking extremely good. Um, there's, uh, there's little evidence that any other alternative prediction method uh, among these lar- many predictor methods works better than the dynamic factor models, and most of them tend to work uh, worse, uh, and some by a fair margin. So I'm going to show you uh, one, just one set of results, which are results from a paper of Mark and myself, but I think they're representative and typical and give you a flavor of what's going on. And those results um, are for, this is using these different shrinkage factors, and this is a mechanism for comparing 
a large number of different um, alternative procedures. Remember I, how I said that those things like bagging and BMA and all those things that you wouldn't go to the seminar for uh, all turn out to have these shrinkage representations. And that means that the performance of these different procedures can all be compared just by looking at that shrinkage function. And these are just different shrinkage functions, functions for different procedures. Uh, BIC is a hard thresholding, so for the data set we have, uh, LNT over T happens to be 2. Point whatever this is, 2.4. So if, it's, if the T statistic is less than 2.4, you don't use it. And if it's greater than 2.4, you do use it. So that's a hard threshold, um, L, uh, sort of S, uh, an L hard thresholding function. These other things more have more S shapes. This thing here is for bagging, uh, which I'd never described, so it's hard to understand what in the world this is, except it turns out that bagging has this psi function, this shrinkage function, so that if the t-statistic is 1, that coefficient does enter the regression, but the coefficient is shrunk to 0 with a weight of about 0.4. Uh, here's a, a green one, which is BMA, and actually this green one is an important one. This green one is empirical Bayes. So there are two parameters to this family of, uh, hyper, of priors. Uh, it's a, a probability p that a, model, that a variable is in the model, and then there's something called a g prior tuning parameter. And so those two priors are estimated by empirical Bayes, and the empirical Bayes estimator says that um, if your t statistic is 2, you basically are getting very little weight, and to get a lot of weight, you've got to have a t-statistic that's out in the four or so range. So it's actually being pretty, pretty tight in terms of how it's discriminating about what uh, variables that it puts in, in the model. All right, so um, let me show you some forecasting, some results. And so what these results are here are their weights on the uh, different principal components. And the principal components are ordered in terms of the size of their eigenvalues, the first being the one that explains most, so the, like the real factor, right? So it's the, the first is the one that explains most of the variation. And then number 121 doesn't explain much of the variation of the x's. The, uh, the forecasting methods uh, here are really not paying any attention. Remember how I said that the, uh, that the estimators are equivariant, uh, permutation equivariant? What that means is that these forecasting methods, every one of these forecasting methods does not look at the index i. All right? It does not depend on i. There's no forecasting method that says, oh, it's the second principal component. I'm going to give it a break. All right? it, it bagging yeah. one works really terribly. And it's, you know, it works really bad. And the BMA one works really bad. This green one is empirical Bayes. And the B empirical Bayes is supposed to work well. And it does work really well. So the green one is empirical Bayes. It works really well. What does empirical Bayes put weight on? It puts weight on the first four factors and zero weight on everything else. So it doesn't know they're the first four factors. It just says, I'm going to do the best empirical Bayes job forecasting that I can. And it turns out that this forecast is the same as a dynamic factor model forecast. And that's for the unemployment rate. Same thing for the inflation rate. It turns out the same thing is not true for the T-bond and actually the T-bond rate was very difficult to forecast in this exercise, and none of the forecasts really did particularly well compared to low-dimensional systems. So it doesn't work universally, but the evidence on sort of these real and nominal variables is that, um, in fact, it worked, uh, uh, is in fact what's being pulled out is in fact just the uh, uh, first four principal components. So this is one take. This is not looking at any forecast, relative mean squared forecast errors, like Mark was talking about this morning. This is looking at something else. But what it essentially says is if you ask what there's this you know, really profound theory they're saying will produce the optimal estimators that are going to solve this frequentist risk problem, it turns out that it says DFM. OK. Um, so. There, let me uh, let me just. This is one other interesting thing. So this is a this is from a comment of Marx on a paper by Giannone, Reichland and Reichland and Sala, in the Macro Annual uh, four years ago, and uh, this is looking at the fraction of variance explained by one and two factor models for a variety of different series, and one of the things that he noticed was that this Sargent and Sims paper a long time ago. 
uh, used many of the same series or things closely related to the series that were used by Giannone, Reichland, and Sala. Of course, these guys used tons of series, and these, this is all that these guys used. But one of the things they were able to do is they were able to use their... They, they actually couldn't extract a factor because they were using these frequency domain methods, but they can compute fraction of variance explained, R-squared type measures. And what they found is that the R-squared explained by one factor was very high for some of these things. So... Uh, you know, for the for industrial production, it was 94 percent. For layoffs, it was 83 percent. For new orders, it was 67 percent. Um, if they increased it to two factors, the amount explained really didn't go up by very much uh, in many of these cases. The remarkable feature that uh, seems to be the case is that many of these results are actually still true when you look 20 years later uh, um, or 30 years later and look at um, uh, much, much larger data sets with many more in, you still see fractions of variance explained that are very uh, amazingly close quantitatively to these smaller DFMs. Uh, in some cases, like the, 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 the um, Euro guy's uh, macroannual paper does a better job with prices. They had more prices in their system than the uh, Sergeant Sims one did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, which didn't have prices, only had one price. Uh, little the, the marginal gain from going from two, one factor to two factors in this model was also fairly modest. <coughs> and so they ended up concluding that the number of factors, number of macro factors, was very, very small. That uh, potentially is a function of what variables were in the system. You know, if there were more variables measuring other things like interest rates or prices, maybe you would get different answers. And there are other, other data sets that are given somewhat different answers to just one factor versus two factor. I would not want to emphasize the one versus two number. I'm a little bit more agnostic on that. But, but the, the in indication that it's a small number um, is pretty, uh, I think, pretty compelling. All right, so... I think what I've done is intentionally gone fast to try to get everybody who wanted to go to the airport out. So I'm done. All right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>